Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. As the poet says, let us fill the cup. What are you having? How about equal parts suspense and mystery with just a dash of terror and chill to taste? So, they say that a lie is only the truth in masquerade. But does the opposite also hold? Can we say that the truth is a lie in masquerade? What is masquerade? Well, for that matter... What is reality? Who are we? Who do we really see when we look in the mirror? The image that gazes steadily back at us, that anticipates our every move, our every breath. Who is it? Or what is it? Darling. Hello, dear. Dinner ready? No. Oh, you plan for us to dine out? No, Gerald. Well, why isn't dinner ready then? I haven't had a chance to prepare it. I was busy. Doing what, Cecily? Oh, learning how to load. What are you doing with that pistol? Learning how to aim. Cecily, don't point that at me. And learning how to fire. Uh, uh, why, Cecily? What? Uh... Our mystery drama, The Many Names of Death was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Alexander Scorby. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You know how it is with some people... They go along for years, in a groove, a routine, or a rut. Characterize it any way you like. Ten, twenty years, the same job, the same apartment, same wife. It might just occur to a man to ask himself, is this all I have to look forward to? There are those men who ask this question and keep asking it. But these are the men who rarely do anything about it. 
It's the men who don't ask, who seemingly plod along contentedly and quietly. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look out. Look out for Gerald Furlong, who fills all the specifications we have just stated. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes. Good morning. My name is Helene LaRue. Yes. I'm your new secretary. Oh. Mr. Spruance, you know him, the personnel manager? Yes. Well, when I heard that old lady McKay... Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Miss McKay was leaving. I asked for the job. And he said I could have it unless you had someone else in mind. Well, I... Uh... Actually, I'm the best typist in the pool. Are you? Oh, yes. You can check it. Everybody always asks for me. Yes, but I don't... Of uh... course you don't know. How could you? Unless we try it. What have you got to lose? Well... Then it's settled. Now, all you have to do is sign this memo. What memo? The memo to Mr. Spruance, which says you authorize my appointment as your secretary. Yes, but I... Uh... Well, now, I don't want you to think I'm pushing you or taking too much on myself. But a good secretary handles all the details, ties up all the loose ends, keeps the desk clear. And as soon as you sign that, I can call Mr. Spruance's secretary. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's it. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Furlong, you do have a bold... Old, strong handwriting. Unusual, sir. But that's to be expected. Expected? Oh, yes. You see, your name is Gerald. Yes. And do you know what the name Gerald means? No. Well, it's an old German name. It means strong leader of an army. Hello? Hello, this is Elaine LaRue. Tell Mr. Spruance that Mr. Furlong wants me to be his secretary. The memo's on its way. Thank you. Oh, strong leader of an army. Mm, don't you feel like one? I'm afraid I don't live up to my name. Oh, you just think you don't. My dear young lady, I know I don't. Don't call me that. Your dear young lady. Why, does it offend you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. When you call me your dear young lady, you're putting yourself down. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, you make yourself sound like an old man. Oh. Uh, and you're not. You see, I worked in personnel. I had to check everyone's records. Now, Miss LaRue, those records are highly confidential, and they're... Ah, no you're only 45. It's true that you look 55. Now, now, Miss LaRue, one thing I frown upon in this office is the discussion of personal matters. Of course, of course. If you went about things differently... Uh, you would look 35. Miss LaRue, I have some letters to dictate. Yes, sir. This is to, uh, to Mr. Oliver Stevens at Carpenter and Stevens. Uh, you'll find the address in the files. Dear sir, pursuant to, uh... Yes, sir. Uh, read that back, huh? All you said was, uh, dear sir... Pursuant to... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you, uh... uh Miss LaRue. Yes? You know, you've gotten off here on the wrong foot. But, Mr. Furlong... I dislike flattery. I intensely dislike it. I despise it. But I... Now, please do not interrupt me. I am not a fool. Oh, I never said you were. Your flattery is doubly obnoxious because it's, it, it's so, so... So what, Mr. Furlong? Because it's so extravagant, so obvious. Oh, but I wasn't... But, uh, I might tolerate flattery that's that's clever. But you, my dear young lady, are ludicrous. There you go again. Calling me your dear young lady. I'll call you anything I like. I'm your employer. Well, why am I ludicrous? Now, how can you tell me that I could look like a man of 35? Because it's true. Do you know what 35 is? I know what it looks like. Thirty-five. That, that, that's another world, another another generation. I know. Tell me that I could look thirty-five again is, is... Well, it's an insult to my intelligence. I could make you look thirty-five. What did you say? Well, you'd have to dress differently, wear colors, let your hair grow but, long. Miss LaRue, this conversation has become far too well, personal. Well, we can end it any time you say. Uh. <clears throat> now, pursuant to our agreement, I must inquire of you if 
you feel obligated to provide financing for... Yes, Mr. Furlong. At, at the risk of sounding foolish, why did you say I could look 35? I learned something about you, Mr. Furlong. How could you learn anything about me in so short a time? Well, I learned that you're a man who fights against his name. I haven't the faintest idea of what that means. Your name, Gerald, strong leader of men. Oh. Oh, why do you fight it? Why do you deny it? It's what you were meant to be. Really? It's true. Who says so? I do. And how would you know? Because I believe in nomenology. <laughs> oh, it's the science of names. I believe that our names tell us what we are. I think that's ridiculous. Do you? Well, I think birth itself is a mysterious happening. And that parents unconsciously have an insight into what their child could be, and they name him accordingly. They might not even be aware of it. Gerald. Well, I'm certainly not a strong leader of men. But you could be... You have it in you. It's ridiculous. Oh, you said that before. I'll say it again. Why is it any more ridiculous than any other belief? Why is it any more ridiculous than, say, astrology? Tell me, uh, what does Helene mean? Light. Hmm? A torch from the Greek. Light? Yes, light. Have I brought you any? How's the fish, dear? Oh, a bit bland. Bland? Huh? That's odd. It's been prepared exactly as usual, and you never complained before. Well, it just happens to lack taste. But you have to watch your intake of salt. Why? Why? Well, it's just the prudent thing, isn't it? That's what you always say. Yes, I suppose so. Did they replace Miss McKay? Yes. I hope they gave you a mature woman. You can't stand those flighty young girls. What's your new one like? Well, I really haven't noticed yet. Oh? How is that possible? Oh, look, Cecily, my dear, I have so much to do. I simply can't bother to note those things that have nothing to do with business. You are overworked, dear, that's true. I'm aware that I have a secretary, that I dictate letters to her, that she has a name, in this case. Uh, what she looks like, well, well I, I simply couldn't remember. Poor dear. Cecily, tell me something. How old do I look to you? Why? Oh, well, just curious. I hadn't thought about it. Well, you don't have to think about it, just tell me. Well, darling, you look your age. Do I? If anything, a bit older. Really? And that's been responsible for your success. A man who heads up a trust department who's responsible for other people's money can only inspire confidence if he looks mature and... And, uh, settled, huh? Oh, yes, dear, and you certainly do. Is it possible that... Is it possible that anyone could ever take me for, say... Thirty-five? <laughs> Thirty-five? Oh, darling, I, I don't see how. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. Are you sure? No, no, please, forget it. I simply can't imagine why you'd even ask such a strange question. Especially... Especially what? Especially since you're not in the habit of asking idle questions. Coffee? No, no, darling. If you'll excuse me, I'll go to the library. I have some work. Well, Gerald, this... This goes against everything you ever... Why, you made it almost a religion not to bring work home from the office. Yes, dear, I know, but every religion encounters a bit of heresy now and then. Don't stay up too late. No, dear, I just have a few things to check out. Hello? Miss uh, LaRue? Oh! Good evening, Mr. Furlong. Good evening. I was waiting for your call. But what do you mean you were waiting for my call? Well, and I was right. You did call, didn't you? Well, yes. However, my secretary has to expect to work all hours, and if you object, then perhaps you'd better resign. Oh, I don't mind. 
I don't mind at all. You have such a fascinating voice. Now, now see here, Miss LaRue, this is a business call. Of course it is. Look, I had so many things to do today that I, I can't recall if I sent a letter to Mr. Oliver Stevens. Ah, uh, Mr. Oliver Stevens of Comptor and Stevens. That's right. Because if I forget to write one... Well, you did, I, Mr. Furlong. You dictated it, and I typed it, and mailed it. Good. That is a relief. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have to call him this evening and explain that he shouldn't expect to... No, nope, the letter went out. Well, that's... Well, th that's what I, I, I wanted to know. Is there anything else? No, I, I can't think of anything. Oh, then, good night, sir. Good night. Uh, oh, uh, just another minute. C could you tell me what... <laughs> what what the name Cecily means? Cecily? Mm hmm Oh, yes, sir. That's um a Latin name. It means one who is in the dark or blind. <laughs> Yes, dear. Did I wake you? I'm sorry. Oh, working at night's the worst thing in the world for your nervous system. Yes, dear. I'll just brush my teeth and get right to bed. Gerald. Gerald. Who's there? Gerald. Who's talking to me? Look in the mirror, Gerald. I am. I, I'm looking at you. Don't you see me? What is all this? I must be having a hallucination. Look in the mirror, Gerald. Who do you see? I see myself. Oh, you see me. But, but who are you? The image you cast in the mirror. That's me, isn't it? No. That's me. I can't believe this. I, I'm... You're what? What? Drunk? You never drink? Mad? You're the safest man in the city. I'm seeing things. Why? What's happening to me? That's it, Jerry. What is happening? I've gone mad. You will be. Soon, Jerry. Unless you fire that girl. Which girl? Oh, don't play games with me. I've looked at your face for the last 45 years. You have no secrets from me. Why should I fire her? You know why. I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't get rid of her, you're headed for ruin, disgrace, death. How can you say that? It's true. You know it's true. Don't you, Gerald? Deep down, way down, don't you know where it must end? How it must end? Yes. Use your common sense and fire her. First thing in the morning. Will you do that, Gerald? Yes. First thing in the morning, I'll fire her. You look in the mirror, and a perfect stranger starts to talk to you. He wears your face, but you know he isn't you. He knows every thought in your head and every emotion in your heart. But you know he isn't you. Who is he? We shall acquire some new insights when I return shortly with Act Two. There's a face that looks back at our own each time we gaze into a mirror. But is it always the same face? The quick answer, the automatic answer is yes, certainly, of course. This teaches that we should never answer anything without pausing for thought. We might get the same surprise that happened to Gerald Furlong. It was the same face, but it wasn't his. Good morning, Mr. Furlong. Good morning, Miss LaRue. Come into my office, please. Yes, sir. Now, Miss LaRue, I have something to tell you. Oh, I know. You want to fire me. Well, I've been thinking. Uh, a man and his secretary, they, they spend considerable time together, and therefore they should have 
similar temperament. Mm, and you're too busy thinking to have fun. Obviously, we don't have a similar temperament, Miss LaRue. Very well, well. I'll go back to the pool, and you can get yourself another dried-up old maid to match the one you've got at home. Now, see here. Yes, what is it you want me to see? How, how did you know... How did you know I was going to fire you? Well, you keep fighting your name. You're not a Gerald. Look, what are you fighting? You know, you never had a good time in your life. Why should you care? Because I'm in love with you. That's impossible. We don't know each other. We, we, we have nothing in common. Oh, that's all nonsense. You fall in love because you hear a certain tone in somebody's voice. You see a certain light in someone's eye. But how can such a love be lasting? Oh, who says love has to last? You know, love comes and goes. Love is. And then one day, it just isn't. And it's gone. And nobody knows why. And it doesn't matter because sooner or later, it will come again with someone else. You're a strange girl. Oh, we're all strange. We, look, look we, we can't talk here. I, I'll take you, take you out to lunch. No, 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 no lunch. Why not? Because you must lose weight. I'll take you shopping. Oh, I like that jacket. And with the aqua shirt. Oh, but I only wear white shirts. Oh, that's all in the past, darling. Now look at yourself. In no, the mirror. No, no. No? Absolutely not. But how can you tell me? I just don't want to. I insist now. Come on. Look in the mirror. Have you ever seen anything so... so handsome? Well, it's... It's a work of art. Gerald. No. Gerald. This face. This face, you see. It, it isn't my face anymore. Gerald. Don't. Don't kill me. I'm not killing you. What are you saying, darling? Darling. Already? Uh, darling, I... You can't do away with me, Gerald. We've been together too long. We've built up a whole world together. You just can't get rid of me and get another image. Well, what do you think, darling? Fire her, you fool. Get rid of her. Walk out of here before it's too late. Save yourself. I think... What's there to think about? He'll take it. And now, for some sportswear. Good morning, darling. Morning. Bacon is ready. Will you have two eggs? We have cereal. Uh, just a cup of coffee. But you must have breakfast. No, no, I'm fine. Just coffee. Darling, where did you get that suit? Oh, uh, I did some shopping last week. You like it? Well, it, it looks a bit... Uh... Yes? Young for you. Young? And that shirt and the tie. Well, those colors are quite violent. Violent? Well, it's hardly the image for a trust officer. And besides, dear, middle-aged men who strive for a juvenile look only succeed in making themselves appear ludicrous. Which is how I appear to you. No, no, I didn't mean that. I only... Oh, look, look, we shouldn't quarrel, especially today. I, I have to go to Chicago. Oh? Just for a few days. We have to investigate a financial... But you, you'll never travel, dear. Well, I can't refuse this client. No, I suppose not. I'll cut the trip as short as I possibly can. Yes, dear. <laughs> I must say, it's convenient to the office. Well, the rent was higher than you said you could go. It's what? all right. Come here. Mm. Oh. I must say, you learn fast. <laughs> I didn't have to learn. I always knew it. It was just out of practice, that's all. Let me show you what I bought me this afternoon. Look, I hope your account isn't overdrawn again. Oh, it was a steal. My first mink cake. Oh. Was it necessary? No, that's not my Gerald. The king of the army. It's the old trust officer speaking. Oh, I just asked. Don't you want me to keep warm? Of course. That's better. 
What would you like to do tonight? Oh, what are we supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be taking a client to a long and involved business dinner. Oh, well, then let's go to the High Hat Club. Oh, I think I heard of that place. What'd you hear? I don't think it's the kind of establishment I should be seen at. Then what are we waiting for? My turn again. I'll bet. Marty! Hi. Hi. Gerald, this is Marty Trainer. He owns the place. Gerald Furlong. How do you do? Wow, Furlong, huh? That's a good name for a horse player. Oh, he doesn't have to play with the horses, Marty. He's too skillful with the guy. I'm afraid it's beginner's luck. <laughs> when you're hot, you're hot. You're on a streak, ride it. I will. Bet it all. Hey! hey. Come on, darling, you won. Let, you won. Let it ride. Yes, I know. You should be getting home. Oh, I wish I didn't have to go. So do I. You know the right thing to do? Mm. I should divorce Cecily and we ought to get married. Why should we get married? Because we're in love. <laughs> oh, weren't you in love with Cecily once? Well... Yes. Ah, and that's why you married her, but it didn't help. It didn't keep your love alive. You and I will we'll be different. No, we won't. We may love each other till the day we die, and we may fall out of love tomorrow morning. But I want us to keep our love. Oh, love can't be a guaranteed investment. Isn't the here and now enough? Take a pill or see a doctor. Why? I'm the one who's sick. You're killing me. No, no. Don't turn your face away. Look in the mirror. Look at me. I'm looking. Don't you see how I've changed? You, uh, I Look, we, we've never looked so good. Soon, you'll have a new image. And what becomes of me? I'll be dead. Frankly, I couldn't care less. But I'm the only image you're comfortable with. I'm the only image you can live with. I used to think so. I'm learning different. You fool. Get rid of her. Oh, no. She'll get tired of you sooner or later. And then what would you have? Elaine's what I've always wanted. I never had the nerve to let myself believe it. You can't afford her. Who says so? The apartment, the clothes, the gifts, the jewels. And now the gambling. Who knows more about gambling than I do? Haven't I gambled with investments all my life? <sighs> Not the same thing. Except this time I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying life. It can turn all at once. It can sweep you away swiftly, suddenly, like a tidal wave. Gerald, get rid of her. You'll never know what hits you. No. She, she'll kill both of us. I don't care. I don't care. Gerald. What, uh, what do you want? I thought I heard you talking to someone. You what? I heard you talking to someone. Oh, come on. That, that's ridiculous. I thought so, too, at first. But lately, it seems... Well, you seem to be having angry conversations. Indeed. About what? I don't know, but I'm sure I hear voices. You sure you're all right, dear? Is something wrong? No. Uh, no, it sounds like yes. Oh, I suppose I'm a little bit lonesome these days. I see so little of you. Look, darling... Things are becoming impossible at the office. You know, the way the market is behaving. Oh, I know, I know. There are terrible pressures on you. Why don't you quit? Quit? Yes, dear, quit. Find something else. It isn't easy to get a new job at 45. But you don't look 45. You look at least 10 years younger. Well, how would we make out while I was looking around? Well, you've been very judicious with our money. We should have quite a bit put by. Cecily, we don't have. In the present market, our holdings have... Well, they haven't done well. They've lost. They've lost considerable value. Oh. It's my fault. I'm sorry. Well, there's my inheritance. Oh, no, no. No, no we couldn't... It's $50,000. No, 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 no. We, we must never touch it that. It could help ease us along. Cecily. Oh, Cecily. You, 
You're too good to me. Don't say that. I love you. Let's start life all over. Is it something to think about? Yes, it, it is something to think about. The usual place. Ah. What does that mean? Oh, you just said the usual place, which means our lives are becoming predictable. Well, don't you enjoy it there? Tonight, I'd like to go dancing. Hey, if dancing, Marty hires the best band in town. How would you know? You never danced to it. If you want to dance tonight, that's what we'll do. Let's go somewhere else. Why? Because if we go to Marty's, you'll get involved in a card game. No, I won't. I, I promise you. Oh, you make that promise every night, and you break that promise every night. Well, tonight will be different. You'll see. Jerry, I want to go home. Darling, we, we, we can't go just yet. I see no reason why we can't do anything we please any time we want to do it. I've lost too much money. Oh, what? It's only money. I can't quit now. Oh, this place is becoming a bore. I can't afford to. And you're becoming a bore, too. Don't say that. Uh, but I love you. Do you understand? Well, I love you, too. Just another half hour. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes, Marty. Do we feel you in? No, Gerald, no. Don't play with him, please. You can't beat him. What are you talking about? The cards are going to come my way. I can feel it. You can't beat him. His name is Martin. What? At the Mars, the god of war. He's a child of Mars. Gerald, let's leave now. Sure, sure. Look, all I need is just one good pot. Gerald, don't play with him. All right, you go get your coat and meet me here. Oh. <laughs> You and I left, huh? So, no fight for the pot. I believe you were the opener. 500. Oh, a very good bet. I think I'll raise. Make it a thousand. And a thousand better. A man with confidence. However, another thousand. A thousand to you again, Marty. Well, I must respect that. I call. You should. I have a full house. An excellent hand. Good enough to win most of the time, but not good enough this time. What are you... I have four little deuces. Oh. So, let's see. In the pot where your overall bets are $5,500 and added to your previous indebtedness, we have uh, <clears throat> a total of 35000 What? That's impossible. I have your markers here, Mr. Furlong. Care to check the arithmetic? Well, I, look, I don't carry $35,000 around with me in cash. Who does? We can wait till tomorrow. Gerald, are you ready to go? Gerald. Yes. Yes, Elaine. We're ready to go. <laughs> says he's ready to go, but the question is, where? Where do you go when you've just lost $35,000 that you don't have? Where do you go? And what do you do? Well, this could be as good a time as any for Gerald to find out if he can live up to his name, strong leader of men. We'll know everything when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. The time is 11.09. The temperature 20 degrees at Midway. It's not the first time, it won't be the last time, a man will seek to change his image. But is an image like a shoe, a coat, a tie, something a man may take off and cast aside? Can an image refuse to be changed? Can it fight back? It's very late at night, after a disastrous evening, and Gerald Furlong is once again confronting an image in the mirror, the image he seeks to change. And until recently, it was such a quiet, unobtrusive, submissive image. Now will you leave Helene? No. She's ruined you. I can't blame her. Tell Cecily. Confess. Why? Where else can you get the money? The money? The $35,000 you gambled away. I, 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 I'll... You'll what? You 
counted on Cecily's money. You knew it was there. That's why you gambled. That's a lie. Ah, you're talking to me. I can raise it. Where? How? She. She loves me. She'll let me have it. That's what I've been telling you. Confess to Cecily. Confess everything. I'm not Cecily. Elaine. <laughs> In over my head. Please help me. Of course. I knew you would. <laughs> That's what love is. Now, your necklace, your bracelet, and the fur. Uh, well, you want me to sell them? We can raise quite a bit of money. Mm. Maybe not all of it, but enough to, to give me breathing room. I see. I'll, I'll make it up to you later. Darling, I won't do it. But you... We're, we're in love. Yes? You said you'd help me. Help you in the right way. The way you should be helped. What do you mean? The way a man named Gerald should be helped. I don't understand. Gerald, strong leader of the army. Are you going to bow down before the demands of a cheap gambler? I, I lost the money. Well, how do you know you lost it? Honestly. How do you know the cards weren't fixed? I don't. A stand up to him. Refuse to pay him. What? But, but he'll... He'll what? Gambling's against the law here. His club is illegal. He has no claims on you. He can't go to court about it. Yes, but still... Still? Are you going to hold still? Be Gerald. This is how I love you. This is how I help you. Yes. Yes, he has no legal claim. You're, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Mr. Furlong. Absolutely right. I have no legal recourse. Then I shall say good day to you, sir. But I have other alternatives. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> can you? I can imagine that you'll try to frighten me with your uh, underworld connections. <laughs> underworld connections? You've seen too many movies. You think you can scare me with strong-arm tactics? I'm not afraid of you. Why should you be? Or anyone else. I've been in a war. I know how to use a weapon. I have one in my house. I can defend myself, and I will. Now, you are a trust officer for an important brokerage house, Oh, huh? I see. Blackmail. <laughs> not afraid. I'll deny I was ever in here. <laughs> you can't. You see, we have proof. <laughs> what do you mean by proof? Well, now, when I press this button, that white screen comes down from the ceiling. And another button. And we have a projector. And now we have a motion picture, and look who the hero is. Oh, why, it's you. I, I don't believe it. Ah, oh, Mr. Furlong, isn't it true? One picture is worth a thousand words. How were you? You photograph. I mean, there you are, betting, raking in the money. Oh, you are a gambler, sir. That's obvious. How you relish what you're doing, huh? Well... Have you seen enough? What will you do with it? Show it to my... My, my management people? Oh, yes. Well, it won't do you any good. They'll fire me. That won't get you your money. Oh, yes, it will. What do you mean? They're not responsible now, for listen, what I... we exhibit this little documentary. We tell your management, unless they make good on your debt, we will show the picture to their clients. We will say to them, here. Here is how a man who handles your money amuses himself in his spare time. Is he doing this... With your money? I think your management will pay us off, don't you? Would you? Violence? Who needs violence when this kind of persuasion is so much more, uh, persuasive? I need time. Of course. Take a few days. Take a week. Even more. And think about it. I'm sure something will occur to you. It's empty. What happened? She's gone. She's disappeared and she took everything. What's this paper? <laughs> Darling, love comes, love goes. And for us, it's over. Think about me as I shall think about you. And remember always, remember your name is Gerald, strong leader of a host. She's 
gone. She's gone. Of course she's gone. What did you expect? Where are you? What do you think I am? Look in the mirror. A mirror? A small mirror with a pearl-encrusted border. She was going to take it along with everything else, but she forgot. Well, what are you going to do now? No. No, I'm, I'm going to... Not too late. Get down on your knees to Cecily. Pray to her to forgive you. Never. No, not to her. Not to Cecily. You can't afford to have pride. I'll get the money somehow. Oh, no. Not that way. I know what you're thinking. Look, it's the only way. I won't let you. I won't let you kill her. I'll stop you. It'll be a burglar. No. Yes, a burglar. And, and, and he killed her. No. No, Th- Gerald. That's how it happened. I've got the gun at Don't home. do it, Gerald. She'll be angry, but in the end, she'll forgive you. I'll have an alibi. They'll never be able to prove Gerald, it. Gerald, don't. Don't kill her for her money. I have to. I won't let you. You can't stop me. I can warn Cecily. How could you? You, you, you can't. I'll stop you. I'll kill you first. <laughs> Cecily? Cecily, where are you? Here. I'm here, darling, in the living room. Oh. How are you? As well as can be expected. What does that mean? Considering that my husband has... A. Deceived me with another woman. B. Squandered every dollar he has in the world. And C. Plans to murder me for my inheritance... I don't feel too badly. What on earth are you... Is it true? Uh, uh, Where where could you possibly get such a crazy idea? You told me. I told you? Yes. Strangest thing happened. I was sitting at the mirror combing my hair. And I looked in the mirror and it wasn't my face at all, but yours. That's... That's impossible. And you started to talk to me. And you told me everything, including the fact that you want to kill me. No, it, it isn't true. Look, how, how, could you, how could you see my face in the mirror? But I did. And you spoke to me. It could have been a dream. Perhaps. But does it matter? Darling, I... I love you. Why, why would I... I suppose I've been blind, but no more. I wish I could convince you. What are you looking for in that drawer? Uh, for, I'm not looking for anything. That's not true. You were looking for this. Cecily, don't. You... You couldn't shoot me? No, I couldn't. I'm not like you. Then... Why are you pointing that pistol at me? Get out. Get out? This is no longer your home. I'm no longer your wife. And I'm holding this gun because as long as I hold it, you won't be able to kill me. Cecily, you're mad. It's all in your imagination. Stay just where you are. Well, we've been married 22 years. We, we, we love each other. Not another step, I warn you. Cecily, you wouldn't shoot me. You couldn't. Stop. Give me that gun. No. 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 Drop it. No, no you want to kill me. Help. Shut up. Help me, somebody. He wants to kill me. I'll, I'll help you. Keep out of this. You keep out of it. Oh, uh, get back. Back in the mirror where no. you belong. No, I don't. I don't belong no. there anymore. You have another image. Get away. Let her go. Let her Gerald. Uh, Gerald. He he saved you, Cecily. He saved you. Gerald. A better man than I am. Who? Look in the mirror. Let me get a doctor. Look in the mirror, in the mirror. Do you see him? Him? I don't see him. Then... He's gone, too. He's gone. Gerald? Oh, Gerald? They're both gone. Gerald and the image. I know we have the realists in the house and the psychologists who will tell us that they can reduce it all to a matter of the inner self. Split personality. Guilty conscience. Well, to each his own. It could have been an image acting independently. Proof, absolute proof is missing for both sides. I'll return in a few minutes.
French philosopher once said, we leave a part of ourselves behind us each day. That's true. But where do we leave it? Sometimes a very close and introspective look in the mirror might help us arrive at the answer. Answers. So much in demand and so short in supply. However, we do have the full answer for your mystery, suspense, and excitement needs right here. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Laurie March, William Redfield, and Marion Haley. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Perhaps you can try to take up your life again. I must see her, Gordon. See her? That's why I'm here. Why I asked you here. I must see her, Gordon. Gaze upon her lovely face once more. But, but she's buried. Buried a week ago, you said. In the family vault on the Buckingham Estate. I want to go there tonight. Force entry into the vault. Open her coffin. And look at her once more. Just once more. I need you because I... I fear to go alone. There is more to fear than that, Guy. What do you mean? A, a body, dead and buried for a week in a damp and virtually airless vault. Guy, you'll not see Victorine as she was in life. I shall see her. Guy, this is mad. I beg you to... I must! I don't care what she has become. I must see her once more. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. beyond the moon, a G.I. in the years beyond 2,000 plus. 2,000 plus, science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow, the years beyond 2,000 A.D. 2,000 plus presents A Veteran Comes Home. <laughs> I told you before, Daddy's spaceship arrived here several hours ago. The spaceship from Mars has been here since 11 o'clock. Then where is he? Why don't I see my Daddy? Because, darling, all the soldiers have to go through quarantine and army regulations and all sorts of things. Boy, my Daddy's a space soldier. I'll bet he had all sorts of adventures. I'll bet he had... Attention, please. Quiet, Billy. Listen. All relatives of military personnel of rocket ship Militant Flight 82 from Mars holding blue cards report to take five. Oh, Billy, that's us. The soldiers are going to come out in a few minutes. Come on, darling, come on. Will he know me, Mama? Will Dad know me? Will I know him? Watch where you're walking, Billy. Of course he'll know you, dear. He'll see me first and... Then he'll see you. All I ever saw was his picture. Stand by that rope, Billy. We can see Gate 5 from here. Boy, he'll tell me all about the war on Mars. Oh, Billy, it's so good to have him back. Five years. Five long years. Can I see the spaceship later, huh, Mom? Later, maybe? Relatives of military personnel of spaceship militant. 
Please do not cross the white line. They're starting to come out now. Look, that man there in the white uniform, he's an atomic gunner. My picture book tells all about them. Eleven weeks on a spaceship getting to Mars. Eleven weeks coming back to Earth. And more than four years fighting on Mars. Five years. Billy, stand back. Don't cross the white line. Flight 7, rocket ship crater from Earth to Moon will blast off in eight minutes from rocket cradle 9, west section. Clear area. Clear area. Over there, look, Mommy, a band. They're going to play music. They're welcoming the soldiers home, Billy. The first soldiers home from the war on Mars. More soldiers are coming out, Mommy. Oh, Billy, I'm so excited. Do you see him yet? Hey, Mom, that's a rocketeer with a green uniform. Oh, boy, he shoots rocket guns. I don't see him. I don't see him yet. So many men, so many. Can I have a drink of water, Mama? I'm thirsty. I, I don't see him yet. I still don't see him. I want a drink. Billy, not now. Oh, look, I think that's Daddy. No. No, it's not. Oh, Mike. Michael, where are you? I'm going to show my daddy my toy gun. We'll play space soldier together. We'll have fun, Billy. Billy, I see him. I see your daddy. Where? Which one is he? Wave to him, Billy. He's looking around to see if we're here. In the yellow uniform over there. Michael! Michael, darling, here we are, Michael. He sees us, Mommy. He's running to us. He's pushing the other people away. Oh, he looks so wonderful. We're tired. Michael! Michael! Oh, and Mommy, oh. why are you crying? Because he's come home, dear. Michael's come home. Hey, Dad! Here we are! you Hey, Daddy! Here he comes! Oh, Michael! Mary. <laughs> Mary, darling. Darling. Oh, so long since I've held you. Uh, but, uh, Michael, you've got to meet your son. <laughs> Hello, son. Hello. Well, is that all you've got to say to your daddy? Oh, he doesn't have to say anything. Just let me look at him. Oh, you've got forever to do that now, darling. Because you're home. Our soldier has come home. <laughs> Three o'clock in the afternoon, Mom. Why is Daddy asleep? He was tired, Billy. He wanted to rest. He didn't talk much when we came home, did he? No, but he will. You and he will have a lot to talk about. Hey, hmm? I think I heard him getting up. Well, we'll open the door carefully and peek in. Now be quiet in case he's still asleep. Shh. It's all right. I'm awake. Oh, well, you slept two hours. No, I haven't been asleep. I'm just lying here. Is something wrong, Michael? Do you feel all right? Oh, sure, sure. Just can't get used to being home. I'll make a snack for you. Billy, now you can talk to your father. Come here, son. Uh, sit on the bed. Okay, Dad. I'll call you when everything's ready. Uh, what do you uh, want to tell me, Billy? I, I don't know. But your mother said... Well, do you like me? Well, of course I like you. Will you play with me? Well, I'm I'm a little tired, son, but... I guess it can be arranged. What do you want to play? Soldiers, space soldiers. You're a soldier and Play something you... else. You don't like me. Just... Just play something else, that's all. But all the kids think it's swell my dad's a space soldier. Nobody else in my gang has a dad who's gone to Mars. I told him when my dad came home, he'd show me how to play real soldier, and we'd have Stop talking to... about it. Yes, sir. Don't say yes, sir, to me. I don't ever want to hear you say that. <laughs> well, 
Stop <laughs> crying. Men aren't supposed to cry. Space soldier. For 200 years, the world hasn't had a war. For 200 years, the human race finally got peace. Federated world in the years after 2000. Science flourishes. Civilization grows. Then we learn how to travel in outer space. First the moon for scientific observations. Then we go on to other planets. Mars. The one planet we know is capable of sustaining human life. And all the 200 years of peace gets rotted away. Because the Earth wants to explore Mars and the Martians object. New worlds to conquer where the Columbus is of 2,000 plus... And the interplanetary war begins. We have to fight for every canal, every inch on Mars. Well, I don't want any son of mine thinking it's so great. I hate it. Hate it. I was going to play space soldier with Space soldier. What do they do? Full of the romance of Mars, the mysteries of the unknown? How can you or anybody on this particular world know what it's like in that unhuman place called Mars? Play, space soldier, play. I remember the patrol. Patrol into the red grass. Blades sharp as swords and covered with that sickening ooze of the Martian vegetation. We went on patrol, 14 of us. I was the patrol leader. All right, let's stop a minute. You see anything? Just the red grass. Wait, about a mile and a half over there, a sand belt. Give me your glasses. Yeah, that's right. Wherever the grass meets the sand belt, we've got to be careful. Those sand spiders, more dangerous than a cobra. One bite and you're dead in half a minute. Men are all wearing shin boots. We'd better put on our masks and gloves, too. Sometimes a spider crawls up the clothing. Okay. Masks and gloves, protective gear. Protective gear? Oh, no. It's too quiet. I've always got the feeling the Martians are around when it's this quiet. Yeah, I know what you mean. And we'll go on now. Leo, you take four men and cover the left. Use electric rifles. Yes, sir. Have Mulroney take four men and cover the right. Torpedo pistols. Yes, sir. Ted and I'll take the other men and move straight on. Ted, we'll use atomic shell clips in our guns. We meet opposition and have to blast them. Leo's and Mulroney's groups can cover us as we move around the area we've radiated. Uh, better keep our belt Geiger counters handy. Okay, Captain. Let's move. The slime from the grass sticks to everything. Yeah. Careful. Careful those sharp rocks. There certainly aren't any Martians on that sand belt or we'd see them. If they're around here at all. They're between us and the sand belt, hiding in this red grass. Look out, huh? Jump away. Don't want to step on it. Good Lord, I didn't see it. A tooth flower. Those flowers are hard as ivory. It's a carnivorous plant. If you walk too close to it, it'll bite your leg in half. Mars. The nightmare planet. And we'll keep moving. And keep your eyes peeled for killer vegetation and enemy Martians. Oh, it's getting hot. I always get like another about this time of day. Leo's group is moving ahead. Apparently, they found nothing dangerous yet. Hello! Hello! They're waving. Everything's okay. Don't be too sure. Look over there. Sandstorm. Whipping across the sand belt. They come up in seconds, blast by at hundreds of miles an hour. Everybody down! Hit the track! Hit the grass! Hit the grass. Who's all over us? Grass blades like an Indian picker lying down in a bed of knives. Hug the dirt. Here comes the sandstorm. Wait a few seconds. 
All right. Get up. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. Two men missing. Here comes Leo. Careful. Two men, Davis and Martin. What happened? They're dead, sir. Wind tore Davis' jacket. A sand spider bit him. Wind carried a swarm up into the grass. What about Martin? Don't know what caused it, but he's dead all right. Come on. Let's take a look. There he is, sir. His skin is natural, not blue the way it turns when a sand spider kills you. Let me see. Good Lord. What's the matter? The Martians. Martians? They got him during the sandstorm. He must be around somewhere. Look at his back where I opened the jacket. Hit by a sonic beam. Right. That super sound wave gadget of theirs turns your guts to jelly. The Martians are here, all right. Now warn the men. Lie down. <whistles> Give me your pocket magnet speaker, quick. Here you are, sir. Right. Leo, crawl in your belly over to the boys. Keep low. Okay. Let me know when you get there. Meanwhile, I'll talk on the magnet speaker. Yes, sir. The Martians will hear me. So here's some lingo they won't understand. Now, get this. We got company for tea. Be trigger happy and remember the Alamo. Is Leo there yet? Can't see him. Wait. He's coming on the UHF talkie. Snap on your earphones. Okay, Leo. No sign of the enemy. We're fanning out. We're covered by the red grass. We passed word, shoot first. Good. That's an electric rifle. Enemy sighted. The jelly got one. They're east 200 yards. Let's move in. Give them everything. Yes, sir. Come on, Ted. Right with you. I'm going to try to crawl through this grass. Torpedo pistols. Our own group has made contact. Leo. Leo. Yeah. Whoever reaches 100 yards, throw atomic grenades. Right. The Martians haven't returned any fire yet. Well, they're probably waiting till we get closer. And they'll fan the area with that sonic beam of theirs. Shed loves at 100 yards. He's throwing the cookies any second. Plug your ears. Check. That should have cleaned them out. Well, we've got to be careful. We can't go in to see. We don't have any anti-radiation gear. No sound from the Martians. Nothing. Leo. Leo, any report from you? I think we got him. Absolutely no sign of life. Move south a few hundred yards. Then east. Probe their positions. Right. Captain, I'm pretty sure it's all clear. Yeah, you're probably right. I just feel conservative right now. I'll be glad when they verify the Martians are cleaned out. This heat, this stinking grass. What a planet. Well, at least the moon is dead. Why weren't we satisfied when we got to the moon? No, we had to go on to this forsaken... Listen. The sonic beam. The Martians are attacking. They must have had a group to the south. They got some of them. They're shattering them down. Look at them over there. We can't help them. Just hug the dirt. Look at all those men. Don't you think I know that? What are two of us against the Martian patrol? Try to reach Leo. 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 Come in, Leo. No response. I gotta get over there. You're staying here. We've got to stay here and try to get out later. But, but Leo. Leo's my brother. My brother. Well, here's your snack, darling. I hope you like. Where's Billy? I thought he was in here with you. He uh, went up. To play? I don't know. Oh, he has been so looking forward to having his daddy back. All the kids in the neighborhood are waiting to meet you. He's been boasting about you for months, ever since we got word that you were coming home. Yeah, I know. Michael, is something wrong? Did you and Billy have a quarrel? He's... He's a stranger to me, Mary. A stranger? You're wrong, son. He was just a baby when I left. I... I can't get used to him. Oh, but you will. You can't help loving him. I can't get to know him until he stops this terrible business of reminding me all the time. Reminding me of what I want to forget. 
But he's proud of you, of what you've done, of what you... You know, I told him what it was really like up there. He ran out of here crying. Michael! Well, what do you want me to do? Throw out my chest and brag about being a hero? Pretend that a planet called Mars, that Satan himself, with the aid of a few million devils, must have created? Pretend that Mars is heaven? That fighting a war so far away it takes months to get there is fun for the kiddies? I'm... I'm sorry, Mary. Just... Just leave me alone. Michael, this isn't like you. How do you know what I'm like after all these years? I hardly know myself at this moment. Five years away from people. Away even from the one world in the universe that contains human beings. But there were other men with you all the time. Hundreds, thousands of them. What do you mean you were alone? Oh, you don't understand. Michael, darling, I'm worried about you. A spaceship. Half a mile long. Eleven weeks in flight, confined quarters. The same blank faces of men torn from their planet, catapulted into infinity. A fleck of controlled cosmic dust. And being alone. And on Mars, the base dug underground. Living in plastic shells for barracks. Never being able to move except in patrols. All of us men in a nightmare. And being alone, in our souls alone. Give me some coffee. All right, Michael. Here you are. Thanks. Michael, you're home now. And you're not alone anymore. It's good coffee. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon and evening, that is. Yes? I'm giving a party for you. At first, I was going to have it a surprise for you, but I think you should know. I don't want a party. We've our families here, and all your old friends. They want to see you, Michael. Everyone's so happy you're home. Call it off. But, Michael... I don't want to see them. Can't you understand? I don't want to see them. They're smug hellos. They're glad you're back, Chatter. They're what's it like in another world and how's Mars, old man, questions. They wouldn't understand the answers if I could somehow force myself to talk about it. But it won't be like that. They love you. They're happy to For the last back. time, no. Darling, you can't go on like this. Fighting the Martians in your memories and fighting the human beings who love you. For your sake, Michael, I am not going to call off the party. Everyone is coming just as I planned. And you've got to meet them and see for yourself. You, you've got to understand for yourself that you're home again on Earth. And that you have a life to live once more. Do you mean that, Mary? I do, Michael, darling. I do. Because I love you. Well, I'm really a stranger in this house. Not really the head of it. Still alone. A barracks filled with chintz curtains. Savannah. Coffee. All right, Mary. Have your party. Without the guest of honor. Michael! anywhere. The birds. The wonderful sounds they make. Five years. Never saw, never, never heard a bird. The only creatures that ever made a sound up there were the Martian contorlies. Fat, greasy lizards that screamed like tortured souls. Look. Look at those flowers. Blue, green, bird orange, clean white. Sweet, glorious smell. Peaceful. So peaceful in which to be alone. The, the grass, the, 
The grass was short, soft, carpet-like blades. A carpet of green, cool and gentle. I'll just sit on the grass. Lie on the grass and rest. Rest and think. 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 I remember when Ted and I got back to command post. The Martian sky was dark. Clouds up there never looked like these clouds. We hadn't spoken to each other for a long while. How we got away alive from the ambush, I'll never know. And now we were coming to the base and the commander. That the full report, Captain? Yes, Commander. That's right, sir. A fourth successful ambush by the Martians in as many days. We're going to have to do something drastic to stop it. Air observation doesn't help. Endless miles of grass and sand. And the Martians are small. Hide in the stuff. Take on its coloring like chameleons. If it weren't for their sonic beam, those, those killing sound waves, we could probably handle them. Sir. I know, I know. Can't the Earth Science Council work out a defense, sir? Yes, they're trying to. But even if they do, till we get it up here, we'll all be decimated. I'm thinking of an old weapon. Poison gas. That's an outlawed weapon, isn't it, Commander? Outlawed on Earth, yes. But we're not fighting on Earth, Captain. Uh, Sometimes I wish they'd never invented spaceships. Well, let's not worry about it now. You may need some rest. Report to the hospital barracks. Take five days there. Yes, sir. Oh, one more thing. Lieutenant, of the 12 men on the patrol who were lost, one was your brother. Am I right? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Now get to the barracks and get some rest. We've got a lot to do in five days. That's all, gentlemen. The commander is sorry. Now get to the barracks. Don't take it so hard, Ted. Well, why shouldn't I? It isn't just because Leo was my brother, but because he was someone special. Up here on this rotten apple called Mars, we're all people out of touch with the decent things of our world. Now, look, kid, it... Every man who lives here, lives up here, he's in his own vacuum. Can't believe what's happened to him. Finding himself in a place where things that are unreal to the human mind are everyday realities. But I had something. I had the one thing that made me a human being up here. I had... I had someone who loved me. And whom I loved. And now he's dead. And I've got no one. I'm like everyone else up here now. I've got no one. I guess I haven't been very nice at that. Come here, Billy. Son, I brought back a lot of bitterness from the other side of the universe. But a little while ago, I thought back to what another man told me on Mars. And I realized something that I didn't understand at the time. I'll be all right from now on, Billy. You and I are going to be real friends, real pals. Can we, can we play soldiers? How would you like to play baseball or build model jet planes together? Or go on a hike in the woods? Gee, that'd be swell. I'd like that. You didn't care what you did with your dad, just so you did something with him, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. And all you could think of was soldier, because that's what I did. Just proves how right Ted was. To be together... And to love someone, that's what makes us human beings. Michael! Hello, Mary. Daddy and I are going to play baseball and have a hike and everything. Oh, Michael. 
Michael. It's all right now, darling. It's all right. Your soldiers come home. <laughs> Next week, another exciting and unusual story from the world of tomorrow, from the years beyond 2000 A.D. Be sure to listen. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Bill Griffiths portrayed Mike, Joan Shea was Mary, Alan Shea was Billy, Charles Smith was Ted, and Lon Clark was the commander. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby, sound Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner, engineer Bob Albright. This is Ken Marvin speaking. From Hollywood, Barry Sullivan in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in... The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Sullivan, famous motion picture stage and radio star in Revenge, a drama of the unexpected. <coughs> I'm not going to have very long to tell this, so I'd better be quick and come to the point. <coughs> no, I'm not going to have very long at all. Please don't talk, Mr. Hastings. Try to save your string. Well, what for? I know I'm going to die. I've got to tell somebody. It might as well be you. It's funny, I've always wanted to keep it a secret before. Now I'm ready to shout it to the whole world. I began at a party doing the Mardi Gras. I was feeling very foolish, dressed up as a pirate, and she was across the room. I think she was supposed to be a slave girl or a harem dancer or something. She was wearing so little costume, you really couldn't be sure. As a matter of fact, the chief thing I remember... His long, copper-colored hair, a low, throaty voice, and brown arms covered by brass bracelets that jingled as she came closer. May I have the next dance? Uh, sorry, baby, my card's all full. Then I'll have to cut in, won't I? Are you forcing your attentions on me? Will I have to use force? You are a very determined young lady. Do you always get what you want? If I want it badly enough. You sound spoiled. No, but I'd like to be. Well, do we dance, or are you just toying with my emotions? We dance. She danced like she talked, slow and with meaning. As I swung her close against me, her bracelets tinkled and caught the rhythm of her feet. Yeah, let's cut this. I've got to get out of here. All right, where are we going? Well, uh, where do you belong? Well, that's a good question. You answer it. Well, don't rush me. I'll let you know in a little while. I'll meet you by the front door. I may not wait. I'll have to run that risk. You don't sound very worried. I'm not. 
Yes. But in case you should get lost or misplaced, what do I ask for? A big boy with an evil glint in his eye. Any answers to... Most anything that has a pretty voice and a pretty face to go along with it. Any particular name? Mine or yours. Oh, I'm willing to make a fair trade. I'm Mark Hastings. Hello, Mark. I'm Ellen. Just Ellen? Well, if it makes any difference, it's Grandview. Ellen Grandview. It did make a difference. It made all the difference. Because to me, the word Grandview meant fear and hatred and death. That name had kept me alive for ten years. Had brought me 2,000 miles to New Orleans. Driven me through the iron-grilled streets of the city seeking revenge, hunting with murder in my heart. It doesn't matter why I wanted to kill old Evan Grandview. I had my reasons and they were good ones. But there's no time for that now. <coughs> All you need to know is that I did have to kill him. And he didn't even think I existed. Couldn't possibly have realized that somewhere in the same city was a man whose life he had ruined. A man completely consumed by the desire for revenge. Well, I'm back, Mark. I could hardly bear waiting. Well, let's go. Your place? No, no, I haven't got a place. Oh, poor child, no roof over her head. Oh, I didn't mean that. I live with my stepfather, but it's too far out of town. We don't want to waste that much time. Your stepfather? Yeah, why? Oh, I don't know. I, I knew some Grandviews once, or rather my father did. It was in San Francisco. Oh, really? My stepfather used to live there. His name is Eben. No. No, it wasn't the same one. So it was the right family. And she was a stepdaughter. Well, that made everything very convenient. I'd have an easy entrance into the house, and she'd come into a lot of money. It was a break for both of us meeting like this. Uh, uh, maybe we, we should get to know each other better. Yeah, maybe... I'll drive you home. Oh, I wouldn't want to take you out of your way. Besides, I'm not quite ready to go yet. Where where did you say you lived? With my stepfather. Oh, yeah, that's right. So what kind of a guy is he? My mother seemed to like him. And you? What difference does it make who else I like? As long as I like you. I guess that'll do. For now. <laughs> Later that night, I found out that she lived along one of the bayous about 15 miles out of town. The place was gigantic. <coughs> Rising out of the gray, green moss and cypress and swamp water with all the white splendor of a mausoleum. But Grandview was away for the weekend, looking after some property in the northern part of the state. So I decided to renew my acquaintance with Ellen in the not-too-far-distant future. Hey, how did you know it was me? Oh, I have hunches. Can I come out tonight? No, I'll meet you in town. Have a drink ready for me. I'd rather come out there. Why are you so interested in this place? It's dead as a tomb. Well, I'd like to meet your stepfather and ask for your hand. <laughs> Is he back yet? Yeah, he got in this morning, but he's not feeling well. I think that trip was too much for him. You should spend more time at home. Why all this interest in Evan? You talk more about him than you do about me. Well, a man talks about a lot of things that aren't important. Ah, that's your story. I'll be by in an hour. It better be true. Ellen was a pleasant way to pass the time, but I'd been squiring her for a week, and I wasn't one bit closer to the old man than the night I first met her. And I had to get closer. There was a nice, clean 38 automatic in my pocket, waiting for an introduction. Two days later, the hatred had crept out of my brain and down into my itching fingers. I just could not wait any longer. I might lose my chance. I had to kill Eben Grandview that night. The blue roadster gathered moisture on its windshield as I drove down the twisting bayou road. After I nearly went off into the swamp a couple of times, I managed to keep the speedometer under 70. The Grandview place looked like the Taj Mahal in the moonlight, only there wasn't any dome. I had to hit the brakes hard to keep from going into a rose arbor. I was afraid that I'd waken the whole house. But there wasn't a sound from any of the pitch-black Moorish windows. I slipped the safety catch off the 38 and started in toward my revenge. I 
I'd sneak through the garden and across the driveway with all the stealth of an eloping bridegroom. I had my pocket knife poised to go to work on one of the windows when... Nice doggy. Quiet. Please be quiet. Nice doggy. I, I, I'll bring you a big steak. Porterhouse steak. Go on, you beasts. Cat. Nice doggy. Shut up. But the bloodhound wasn't having any. He was a big brute, red-eyed and ugly. In the faint light, his teeth looked like a greenish-yellow underneath long, slobbering jowls. I shifted the pistol over to my right hand, raised it above my head, and waited for the dog to close in. Then I jimmied the window catch, swung it open, and dropped inside, landing on an oriental rug that was made for waiting. There wasn't any need to turn on a light. I knew about where the stairs should be. Sticking close to the tapestried walls, I'd inch my way along into the main hall when... The sound echoed through the pitch-black house. The low, low-pitched moans of a sobbing woman. Who's that? Who is it? Take it easy, Ellen. Mark! Mark, what are you doing here? I want to see your stepfather. You... You want to see Evan? That's what I said. Where is he? No. No, you can't go near him. Get away. Get away from here, Mark. Sorry, baby. I'm not leaving yet. I've got some unfinished business. No, get out of here. Shut up. What are you doing with a gun? I'm going to make you an orphan, baby. I'm going to kill Eben. You're going to kill Eben? You can, Mark. You can. Where is he? You wanted to kill him all the time, haven't you? Haven't you? That's right. Yes, you haven't cared about me. You've been after Eben. I understand that. Now, you don't care anything about me. I wouldn't say that. You're pleasant enough. All right. Go ahead upstairs, the first door. He's in there waiting for you. Go ahead, Mark. Kill him if that's what you want. Go ahead and kill him. The old man was lying on the big four-poster bed, staring at me. His eyes were glassy, and a little stream of saliva curled down his cheek. I walked over beside him. I pulled out the gun, but he didn't say a word. <coughs> and something told me what had happened. I bent over and put my hand on his forehead, and it was hot. Inhumanly hot. But his heart was cold and still. Somebody or something had beat me to my revenge. Eben Grandview was already dead. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for The Unexpected. for the surprising conclusion of Revenge, a Hamilton Whitney production starring Barry Sullivan, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and directed by Frank K. Danzig. I rushed out of the house, ignoring Ellen's white, tear-stained face. I slammed the heavy mahogany door and stood on the front porch, breathing hard, angry, cheated. After ten years, I'd missed my chance for revenge. And then... Then I saw the sign... First, the red letters on the front door looked blurred and meaningless. <laughs> but after a minute, I could read them quite clearly. Danger. Contagious disease. Cholera. The most deadly disease in the world. <laughs> Re 
Revenge starred Barry Sullivan. Listen again soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. <laughs> program was transcribed in Hollywood. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Dark Venture. The American Broadcasting Company presents Carl Harbord in The Man in 206. I paused on the threshold of room 206. Inside the room was the killer playing the piano in the dark. I struggled to hold my nerves in check, alone in the house, with him. My fingers closed around the small axe as I slowly turned the doorknob. And then, as it is with a drowning man, everything that had happened these last few weeks, everything that had brought me to this door, flashed through my mind. For me, it all began that night the reporter came. The fourth murder in the neighborhood had occurred only the night before, and the papers were full of it. They were calling the killer the executioner, and they said he killed only the helpless. I read all this as I sat in the lobby of my rooming house, and the thought wouldn't leave me. Could it be Frazier? Could it be the man in 206? Oh, I was letting my nerves run away with me. I was letting my hatred for Frazier warp my mind. It was just that everything was falling apart and I couldn't stop it. I remembered how grateful I'd been when Aunt Martha had willed me this rooming house. A chance to make something of my life. Sure, fine chance. In less than a month, I was on the verge of bankruptcy. Three more tenants had left me today. And all because of Fraser. The outside door opened and a young man came in, shaking the rain from his hat. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, what can I do for you, sir? I don't know. That sign on the door intrigues me no end. Uh, how's that? The sign that says vacancy. I didn't think they printed signs like that anymore. Oh, uh, you want a room? Yeah. But I also want a story. A big pardon? My name's Martin. I'm a reporter on the Globe. A reporter? Yeah. Every day on my way to the police station to hear the latest exploits of our friend, the uh, executioner, I pass this rooming house. Every day I see that strange little sign. 
vacancy. Uh, I'm afraid I still don't understand. In this city, hundreds of good, solid citizens are living in chicken coops and garages. All-night theaters or streetcars because there's no place else to live. And yet, here in their midst is a vacancy. But no one accepts the vacancy. Why? Well, uh, most of my guests are transients. They come and go. So I always have a vacancy. That's all there is to it. In times like these... Why do they come and go? Now, look here. Your place looks clean enough. I don't imagine your rates are too high. Look, if you want a room... And also, why are you so upset? There must be a story here. Let my fellow reporters worry about the executioner. I'll tell the story of the vacant room. But I tell you, there isn't any story. As I said... Yeah, yeah, I know what you said. Yeah. I also saw how pale you got when you said it. Look, I'm very busy tonight. When you came in, you said you wanted a room. Do you want it or don't you? Sure. I'll take a room. Make it for a week. Or do you think that's long enough to find out what drives people away? I really shouldn't have rented the reporter a room. But with so many of my rooms vacant, I just couldn't afford not to. After I'd showed him to his place, I decided to see Inspector Garland... After all, he'd been living here in the rooming house for the last eight years, and though I didn't know him very well, Aunt Martha had always considered him her prized tenant. I went down the hall to the inspector's room. I had to talk to somebody. I was desperate. Come in, come in. Inspector, I'd like to speak to you, if I may. Oh, Mr. Wilson, come in. Don't tell me I've forgotten to pay my rent again. Oh, no, it's nothing like that. It's... Don't be bashful to tell me, man. I've got no memory for details. Your poor aunt was always hemming and hawing, trying to get her money without embarrassing me. Inspector Garland, it's not the rent. I need your advice. Advice? Yes. Oh, what am I going to do about him? Him? I don't understand. Well, Mr. Frazier, of course, the man in 206. Mr. Frazier? I don't think I know him. What about him? Well, didn't you hear him last night? Uh, I've been working nights for the last three weeks trying to find some trace of this creature the newspapers call the executioner. You'll have to bring me up to date. Well, this Mr. Frazier, he must drink or something. He usually comes in after midnight and begins to pound on an old piano I have up there till he's wakened the whole building. Because of him, I've lost every one of my old tenants except you, Inspector. Well, for Pete's sake, why don't you tell him to leave? Well, that's just it. I've never even seen the man. What? My housekeeper, Stella, rented the room to him a week before I came. He paid for two months in advance, and no one's seen him since. But if you'd been here at night, you'd certainly have heard him. Did you ever try leaving him a note, ordering him to behave himself? Yes, last night. I left a note in his door. This morning, the note was torn to shreds. Well, I guess the only thing I can suggest is to wait until the next time he creates a rumpus and then call one of our boys to come in and arrest him for disturbing the peace. Inspector, I'm afraid to wait until next time. Huh? Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's just my imagination, but... Yes? Each time Fraser's gone into one of his rages, there was a murder reported in this neighborhood. The next day, I think Fraser... Fraser might be this executioner. And your housekeeper is the only one who's seen Fraser? Yes. All right, come on, let's talk to her. <laughs> You won't say anything about what I suspect. It'll only upset Stella. No, I won't say anything. Ah, here's her room. Stella, it's me, Mr. Wilson. Come in, Mr. Wilson. Oh, Inspector Garland. Why are you packing, Stella? I was just going to tell you I'm leaving. Leaving? But why? Well, I'm not at all well, you know. I've been under a doctor's care for the last five years, and now this excitement, well, it's just too much. You mean Fraser, Stella? Him and, and that killer, too. I'm worried and frightened all the time. It's just too much. Well, where are you going? To my sister's place. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson. Before you took over, I'd worked for your Aunt Martha, God rest her soul, for eight years. But I've got to think of myself. But I'm trying to get rid of Fraser. You'll never get rid of him. Why do you say that, Stella? That's just how I feel. Oh, I'm just a bundle of nerves, that's all I am. You're the one who rented Fraser's room, aren't you, Stella? Yes, I'm sorry to say. It was just a few days after Martha died, and Mr. Wilson hadn't come yet to take over the place, so I was in charge. Did he seem like the kind of fellow who would carry on like this? Oh, no. He was real nice. Paid two months in advance. Gave me a good tip when I showed him his room. 
He seemed fine. When was the first time you heard him go into one of these rages? Oh, please. I, I told my sister I'd be at her place in an hour. I, I've just got to finish packing. Stella, Inspector Garland is trying to help me. I'm at the end of my rope. Now, please tell him what you heard. Well, all right. I'll tell you about the first time I heard him. It was just about ten days after he'd moved in. I'd gone to bed early, like I usually do, and it wasn't long before I was sound asleep. First, I, I didn't know what had awakened me. Then I realized it was somebody playing the piano. I looked at my dresser clock. Why, it was almost two o'clock in the morning. I put on my robe and went to the door. It was Mr. Higgins, one of our tenants. What kind of a place do you people run here? Listen to that racket. How are people supposed to sleep? Well, where's it coming from? That new guy, Frazier in 206. Well, I'll go tell him to stop. Yeah, do that. He's got the whole building away. I hurried down the hall to 206. There was something so wild about that piano playing. It kind of gave me the creeps. Now I'm standing in front of the door. Mr. Frazier? Mr. Frazier, I, I want to see you a moment. Suddenly, the piano stopped. Then I happened to look up at the transom and I realized there was no light in the room. He'd been playing in the dark. Then I heard him walking real slow to the door. The strangest feeling came over me. Everything was suddenly so quiet. I, I looked down the hallway. All the doors were closed. Mr. Higgins had gone back to his room. Mr. Fraser had unlocked the door. My heart started pounding frantically. But why should it? Then the door started to open. But I couldn't see anything except the darkness of his room. Suddenly, I, I turned and started running down the hall. That's the way it happened to me. I, I can't explain why I ran away, even today. But I just couldn't stand there. I, I just couldn't. All right, Stella, all right. Why, I've got to leave. My nerves aren't what they used to be. Maybe after I rest up for a while at my sister, sister's, maybe maybe I'll be all right. You see what he's done, Inspector. I've got to get rid of him. How many times has something like this happened, Stella? I've heard him play like that four times, and always the same song. But after that first time, I've never gone to his room again except to clean it twice a week during the day when he isn't there. The room's down the hall, isn't it? Yes. Have you got the key? Yes. Oh, come on. Let's take a look at it. Wait. Mr. Wilson. What? I don't want him to hear. Well, what are you talking about? I'll be leaving in a few minutes, but when I get to my sister's house, I'll call you. Coming, Mr. Wilson? I've got something to tell you. What? You'll hear from me. Well, are you coming? Yes, yes, I'm coming. Yes. A nice piano. The place looks all right. Where's that door go? Uh, a small dressing room. It's part of Fraser's place. Why is it locked? Oh, it shouldn't be. Got a key to it? Yes, I think so. It's right on the string here. This one should open it. Let's look inside. Good looking clothes. He must have money. What's this bundle in the corner? Mm, looks like dirty clothes. Hey, look at this shirt. <gasps> blood. And these trousers. All bloody. Then I was right. It is Frazier. He is the killer. Well, maybe. Maybe not. I'll have to have the blood analyzed. But if we wait until he comes back, it may be too late. Listen. Come on. It's him. He's come back. Hello, gentlemen. Martin, what are you doing in this room? Didn't I tell you? I'm a frustrated Paderewski. How come I don't have a piano in my room? Haven't I seen you around headquarters? Aren't you a reporter with the Globe? That's right, Inspector. I'm also a fellow tenant in Mr. Wilson's establishment. Does this room hold the mystery? What mystery? Of the little vacancy sign. Or maybe of the executioner. Uh, uh, uh. There you go, getting pale again, Mr. Wilson. Ah, 
I was terribly upset, but I tried not to show it until after the reporter and Inspector Garland had left. Most of my life, I'd bummed around the world doing everything imaginable. Stevedore, clerk, worked in nightclubs, everything. I was in a hospital clear across the country, recovering from a barroom brawl, when I'd learned I'd inherited the rooming house. It was like a godsend. And now this frightful thing was happening. And if I didn't make a go of my rooming house, I'd be right back where I started. Then, at about 11.15 that night, the phone in the lobby started ringing. Yeah, hello. Hello, Mr. Wilson. This is Stella. Oh, yes, Stella. I told you you'd hear from me, remember? Yes, what did you want to tell me, Stella? I wouldn't want to say it over the phone, Mr. Wilson. Well, then why didn't you tell me before? I couldn't. Not with the inspector around. I don't understand. I lied to the inspector. That night when all the noise was going on, I did see something in Mr. Frazier's room that I didn't want to tell about. Why? Because I don't think I really understand it. What did you see? Well, like I said, I, I don't want to tell you over the phone, Mr. Wilson. You come over to my sister's house and I'll tell you. But there's nobody here to watch the place. Just the same. You come along, Mr. Wilson. It's 354 Westover Place. It's only about a mile. Oh, well, all right. Uh, 354 Westover. There's not much doing here. Uh, I'll be over in half an hour. Fine. I'll wait up for you. And don't you tell Inspector Garland you're coming. Understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I understand. But after I'd hung up, two people came in for rooms, and I was busy with them. And then it started raining again, and I couldn't walk through the rain. I tried calling a taxi, but there weren't any available. And when I looked at my watch again, it was after midnight. Then I tried calling Stella to tell her I wouldn't be able to make it that night and not to wait up for me. But I didn't know her sister's number. At 12.30 I went to bed and I couldn't fall asleep from all the excitement. I finally got up and took some aspirin. And within minutes I was dead to the world. Huh? Wilson! Wilson! Ye yes? Yes? Wilson, open up! Oh, all right, just a minute. Hurry! Inspector Garland, what's wrong? There's been another killing, only this time it strikes home. What? Your housekeeper, Stella. She was found on the porch of her sister's house, strangled. After Inspector Garland told me about Stella, I told him about her phoning me earlier and saying she'd seen something unusual in 206. Then the inspector wanted to see the rooming house register. I took him downstairs and he thumbed through the pages till he found what he wanted. William Frazier, yeah, here we are. Registered November 2nd. And the first of these killings was around then, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Home address, Spokane, Washington. Business, sales. Mm, not much help. No. If there were an address in California, maybe we could trace him. But we don't have any description to go on. Stella's the only one who's ever seen him. Uh, uh, wait. Here's that reporter. I don't want him to know we suspect Frazier. Say, that's Stella Falvin, the woman who got killed tonight. She worked for you, didn't she, Mr. Wilson? Yes. Why do you suppose she was murdered? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Looks like the work of our friend, the executioner. Huh, Inspector? Perhaps. Ah, being a reporter's worse than being a milkman. My paper sent a kid over here at 3 o'clock to wake me up and have me cover this killing. A fine life. Trouble was, I'd just fallen asleep about an hour before... You didn't tell me about these piano recitals, Mr. Wilson. Piano? Take it easy. When I saw you two in room 206, I figured it was vacant. It, it is vacant. Uh-uh. No. Some guy was inside 206 hammering on that piano. And I mean hammering. Is that what chases all the tenants away, Mr. Wilson? I told you. Yeah, I know what you told me. Oh, well. I'm going to hit the hay for a while. I'm dead. He's gone to his room. Come on. Let's go upstairs to 206. Quick. You think Frazier's in there now? There's a chance. Give me a pass key. He's not here. But he's been here. Look at this room. Torn to pieces. Yeah. Now, look. I don't want that reporter to know about Frazier. If he finds out about him, he'll plaster the story all over the front page of that paper of his. Ah, oh, I guess that doesn't matter anymore. Oh, but it does matter. Hmm? Frazier's some kind of a nut. I'll bet anything on it. And he'll be coming back to this rooming house if he doesn't find out we're wise to him. Do you think so? 
You're getting a guest tomorrow. A guest? I'm planting a man in this house to watch it day and night. And one of these nights, if we're lucky, we're going to hear that piano again. But we didn't hear the piano again. And Inspector Garland didn't seem to make any progress finding Fraser. I checked with all the California police chiefs. Any luck? None. He's not wanted for anything. That's a cinch. Maybe he uses a false name. Maybe. Well, that makes it even better. You sure he's never come back to the room? I'm sure. Well, I guess we'll just have to keep waiting. I lost all interest in the rooming house. I wasn't able to hire another housekeeper. Although there was no more piano playing, one by one, my other tenants left me. I'm checking out, Mr. Wilson. Prepare my bill. <sighs> yes, Mr. Hagen. This certainly isn't the same kind of rooming house your aunt used to run. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hagen. Finally, the only tenants left were Inspector Garland, the policeman he planted in the house to watch for Fraser, and Martin, the newspaper man. I see you took your vacancy sign down today. Yeah, I'm thinking of closing my rooming house. Looks like I'm not going to get my story after all. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Yeah, it looks that way, Mr. Martin. I placed the rooming house up for sale and started cleaning the rooms and getting everything in order. And it was while cleaning Fraser's room that I made a discovery that sent me running to Inspector Garland's room. Inspector! Look what I found! What is it? A snapshot? Yes, a man and a woman. And look what's written on back. Huh? Well, Bell and William Fraser, Stockton, California, 1942. Where'd you find this? It was in one of the dresser drawers underneath the paper Stella had used to line the drawers. Uh, this is what I needed. We're going to find Fraser at last. That was three days ago. Then tonight, at about 10.30, Inspector Garland got a telephone call. He was out. He'd been gone all evening. But the policeman he'd planted in the house took the call, and when he hung up, I could see he was pretty excited. When Garland comes in, tell him I went to headquarters. Tell him he'd better get down there, too. Something happened? Yeah, they just located your rumor. William Fraser. You mean they've arrested him? Not exactly. His wife just came down from Stockton and identified his body. His body? Fraser checked into your rooming house on November the 2nd, didn't he? That's right. Well, on the night of November the 2nd, he was killed by a hit-and-run driver. I don't understand. Why we're waiting for him to start playing that piano. He's been lying on a slab in a county morgue waiting to be identified. Then Fraser... Couldn't have been the killer. You're catching on fast, Mr. Wilson. After the detective left, I was all alone in the rooming house. I locked the front door and went up to my room. My head was pounding. It had never been Fraser. Fraser was dead, that's all I could think. I stretched out on my bed in the darkness... My mind searching for an answer. If it wasn't Fraser, who was it? Why had I ever accepted this rooming house? Why had I ever come to this place? Why... The piano. For a moment, I thought my imagination was playing some crazy trick. I clamped my hands over my ears to see if the music was in my head. No, it was real. The killer had returned. And there was nobody in the house but me. I don't know how long I crouched on the bed. I was terrified. What was I going to do? The music went on and on. Then finally, I couldn't stand it any longer. I was going to see who was playing that piano. I was going to find the killer. But I needed something to protect myself. I remembered the tool cabinet in the service closet in the hallway. I left my room and hurried over to it. I snapped on the light. And there, on top of the cabinet, was what I wanted. A small axe. Then I started for room 206. I saw through the transom that there was no light in 206. He was playing the piano in the dark, just as Stella had said. Now I was standing before the closed door. My nerves were at the breaking point. My hand closed around the doorknob. I turned the knob ever so slowly. The door was unlocked. I gripped the axe so hard my fingers ached. And then quickly I flung open the door and snapped the light switch. You! Are you shocked, Mr. Wilson? You killed those people. You're the one they're looking for. This should make you a big man, Mr. Wilson. But what are you going to do about it? I'm going to call the police. The telephone's downstairs. Do you think I just wait here while you call? Then I'll stay here with you until Inspector Garland comes back, and I'm warning you, don't try anything. Is it okay if I play the piano? Why did you kill them? They were all so helpless, so defenseless. Maybe I couldn't help myself. Maybe I didn't even know I was the killer. 
Maybe it was a sickness in my head. They've got a name for that, you know, for a guy who kills and doesn't know he kills. It's called schizophrenia or something like that. And if a guy gets overtired or too excited, he can get an attack, even from something as simple as a song. Well, you killed Stella, too. She was a good woman. She'd worked hard all her... Uh, must you play that same infernal tune over and over again? I like it. It's got kind of a strange rhythm to it when you think about it, hasn't it? I don't care about its rhythm. Just stop playing it. Listen, kind of gets inside you, doesn't it? You're trying to confuse me. That's what you're up to. I hear you once played the piano in nightclubs. I asked you to play something else. Yeah. I hear this tune was your introduction number. I hear you were playing it that night you got hurt in the brawl. It's a good song. What are you doing? What are you trying? What are you doing to I'm me? I'm just playing the piano, that's all. I tell you, stop. Stop that song. Stop it, I tell you, stop it. Hey, hey. <laughs> Take it easy. I'm stopped. You're all alike. Always trying to outsmart the little guy. Always trying to destroy the sick and the helpless. But you can't outsmart me, can you? I don't let you get away with it, do I? I don't let you trample the helpless into the dust. I bring them rest and sleep. I bring them peace everlasting. It's your kind who hurt them. But you won't hurt anyone anymore. I'm going to kill you. Like I killed all the others. <laughs> He's dead, Inspector. I'm sorry I had to do it that way. Why are you sorry? Isn't it best for him? Yeah, maybe it is. Oh. For a minute there, I thought you were going to stay in that dressing room until he scalped me. It was the only thing we could do. I had to get a confession. When did you first suspect him? And I found out he was the only one in the rooming house who'd never heard the music. And, of course, when I found out that Frazier had been dead all along. But I had to prove it. Why do you think he killed Stella? Stella had called him and told him she'd seen something in 206. You know, that sickness he had is a strange thing. He had an attack that night. And though he became a completely different man, he still remembered Stella's call and was afraid she'd seen him. So, he went and killed her. Huh. Kind of makes you feel woozy, don't it? Yeah. You know, after this, people are going to start saying I'm nuts, too. What do you mean? From now on, every time I see a vacancy sign, I'm going to run like the devil. <laughs> Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them on to their venture in the dark. Dark Venture is written by Larry Marcus and directed by William T. Johnson. Next week at the same time over most of these ABC stations, we'll bring you another original story from the land of the shadows. Tonight's dark venture, Carl Harbord was heard as Eddie, Ben Alexander as the reporter, Herb Butterfield as the inspector, Leora Thatcher as Stella, and Harry Lang as the policeman. John Lake was the narrator. Original music by Basil Adlam.
members of the armed services brought or sent to the United States from various theaters of war captured enemy firearms, such as machine guns and machine pistols. Some of these weapons have subsequently fallen into the hands of the lawless element and have been used in committing robberies and murders as well as other crimes. They constitute a serious hazard to effective law enforcement. The National Firearms Act requires the registration with the Bureau of Internal Revenue of any firearm from which a number of shots or bullets may be discharged with one continuous pull of the trigger. This is an appeal to the good reasoning of the possessors of trophy firearms. For the protection of your families and society in general, it's your duty to register the firearm and have it rendered inoperative. Don't delay. Just write to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, Washington, D.C., who will have a representative assist you free of charge. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. again the immortal tale, a terribly strange bed. Jack Westcott was the best friend I ever had. He was the gayest of people. That was until we left America. I was writing a book about historic murder cases and had come to Paris to do some research work. Jack was fascinated with my work, strangely fascinated Almost horribly so. He enjoyed finding twisted minds and probing them. His hunger for crime was bound to end in tragedy. On the last evening of our visit in Paris, we were walking on the left bank of the Seine River when Jack noticed a crowd gathered about our old friend, the head of the Paris police force, Inspector Duval. I was in a hurry to return to the hotel to finish writing my murder manuscript. The deadline was in the morning. But Jack insisted. What's the excitement all about, Duval? Well, hello, Mr. Westcott. Hmm, still looking for ancient murders, Mr. Manning? Not tonight, Duval. Ancient or otherwise. <laughs> Stick around, Mr. Manning. I'll show you a murder the likes of which you've never seen before. Okay, boys. Drag it out of the river. What is it, Inspector? A corpse, Mr. Westcott. A corpse that's been squashed thin as a piece of paper. Oh, let's see it. Oh, what do you mean, thin as a piece of paper? Hey, bring it over here, boys. Right under the gaslight. <gasps> Horrible-looking thing, isn't it? Horrible and fascinating. Well, it looks like it got squeezed in a giant press. We've had an epidemic of these corpses lately. Any idea who's doing it? Not even a vague notion, Mr. Ma... Hey. Hey, you. You, the fat man. You mean me, Inspector? Yes, I mean you, fat man. How come you're always around when we pull a corpse out of the river? Why? I, uh... I enjoy murder. You enjoy it? You enjoy murder? It appeals to my sense of the artistic. Oh, it does. Well, there's something fascinating about these bodies. Uh, something for a connoisseur alone to appreciate. The symmetry of the remains. 
the beautifully flawless flatness of the corpse, uh, the hollow in the stomach, Lying in this puddle of gaslight, this mass of flesh and bones uh, makes a nice picture. I should enjoy painting this uh, if I could paint. I know what you mean, fat man, but uh, wouldn't you prefer probing the mind of a man who conceived this crime? A man's mind is uh, his secret self. Well, enjoy the ghastly spectacle, my friend. Enjoy it. Good evening, gentlemen. All right, men. Take the body down to the morgue and try and find out who it is. Come on, Burke. I'd like to follow that fat man. In heaven's name, why? He's nothing but a psychopathic case. I want to satisfy a hunch. Well, if you're such a good detective, why don't you join Scotland Yard? Well, I might, Burke. I might at that. Where the devil has that gross piece of flesh disappeared to now? He was right in front of us until we turned this corner. Well, we've lost him, Jack, and I don't wonder. We've passed through every side street in the whole city. If you ask me, he knows he was being followed. Good. If he knows, he'll show his hand sooner. Now, the only place he could have gone around here is into the back door of this house. I wonder what house this is. It's a gloomy dump. Let's go back to the hotel, Jack. I've got to finish that manuscript tonight. Looks like a public bar to me. The La Belle Tavern. Are you coming with me, Burke, or are you going home? I'm with you, old boy. I brought you to Paris, and by heaven, I'm going to return you to America. Now, this must be the doorbell. Here goes. And Burke, no matter what I do tonight, don't worry. Come in, gentlemen. Come in. Well, perfectly right, fat man. Those two Americans did follow you. They're sitting at the bar inside. The Americans value their lives so slightly. Amazing, isn't it, Cecilia? Their lives. Our lives. They might be cops. I don't want to get my neck in a noose. To be quite candid, I am not interested in your neck. You're so impatient, and impatience is an evil ascribed to the very young. It might be a pity... If you are not allowed time to cure yourself of that evil... Don't threaten me, you fat pig! <gasps> you pig! I'd hope to slap some sense into that lovely but empty head. Obviously, my stupid pigeon, those two Americans are wealthy. They would enjoy our roulette table. If you would show them to it, remember, I'll talk to the croupier... And he will take care of the wheel of fate. If you don't do your part well, you face a lifetime in jail. What happens if they get wise? Room 16? But, of course. <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> I knew you'd understand. Yeah. I understand. There's something so gay about Americans, I always say. I hope you boys don't mind if I stick around. Well, Miss... Not at all, Miss. Not at all. You can call me Cecilia. How about another drink? That's fine. Three more of the same, bartender. What do you do for a living, Cecilia? Oh, I... I model. In a dress shop. I don't believe you, Cecilia. Jack, stop ribbing the girl. She's a good kid. I'm on the level. I'm interested in it. Here's the drinks. Thanks, why do I interest you? Well, because you're fairly easy to figure out. <laughs> Am I? Why? You really want me to tell you? Sure I do. Well, here's mud in your eye. You say you too say. Oh. Potent stuff, Jack. Potent stuff tastes like cyanide. Well, Cecilia, I'd say you're a poor girl who lives in the slums. But you're pretty. Mm. Prettier than anybody in your entire neighborhood. Well, let's see. And then you must have met a man. What of it? I'm no saint. He promised you a lot of doodabs, and suddenly you found you'd committed your first crime. Let's say, murder. What'd she do? Set her mother on fire? <laughs> oh, well, for that, let's have three more drinks. Bartender, three more. Well, now, let's say it really was murder. The second murder wasn't so hard. And the third was easy, wasn't it? I never had nothing to do with a murder. Well, for the sake of argument, let's say you have. But inside of you, all the time, 
is this wanting to be liked, wanting to be on the level. But your so-called friends, they don't trust you, Cecilia. Someday they'll double-cross you. Uh, here are the drinks. Thank you. Nobody will ever double-cross me. Well, here's mud in your eye. Drink up, boys. <clears throat> is there anything else to do around here? You seen the gambling rooms? Gambling rooms? Ah, that's me. Who runs those gambling rooms, Cecilia? I don't know. One of your friends? A fat man, perhaps, with a long nose? I don't know the owner. Gosh, you're real nice. Uh, is the fat man in the back room now? Probably. Gambles here a lot. Do you... Do you really want to play? Sure. Well, come on, Jack. We'll see who's right. My books or your instincts. Number 21 wins. Jack, the fat man's in the corner of the room. Yeah, I saw him, Burke. And he saw you, old boy. Don't think he didn't. Come on, boys. Let's play. Money, money, money. Place your bets, gentlemen. They'll make some room for us over here. Come on. Okay. Hello, Cecilia. Hello, Monty Laureate. You playing again? I thought you lost every cent you owned last night. A desperate man finds desperate ways to raise money. Mm, even murder, eh? We heard about it. Perhaps. And perhaps not. I'd like you to meet some new friends of mine, Monty. This is Jack Westcott and Burke Manning. Monty Lauriard. How do you do? Money, 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 gentlemen. Place your bets. I bet 30 francs on odd. I'll bet 100 francs on number 13. Good boy, Jack. The play is dead. Round and round the little ball goes where she stops. Nobody knows. Hey, Burke, I feel a little dizzy. You had too much to drink, pal, and those drinks were strong. Number 13 wins. What? I won! Good, Good for oh, you, oh, American. Oh, Lucky oh, for you. Oh, oh. I won the first time I ever played here, but never again. Money, 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 money. That was the first time Jack won on that incredible evening. But as the ball spun, his winnings increased. The table seemed to have gone crazy. Jack became gambling drunk. The croupier seemed desperate as that wheel spun round and round, each time increasing Jack's winnings. The room was tense with excitement, and even the little thin loser, Lawyer, seemed surprised. Again. Monsieur Westcott, your luck is phenomenal. You've won 30 times. 30 times. Jack, you've won a fortune, man. Stop now before it's too late. Leave him alone, Burke. Let him play if he wants to. Sure, let me play if I want to. I want to break the bank. Careful, monsieur. Let me warn you. Careful. Jack, it's almost midnight, and I've got a lot of work to do tonight. Please, let's go. And remember the fat man. The fat man be hanged. Here, Jack, have another drink. <laughs> Thanks, you see? Jack, be sensible. Ah, stop being an old Andy Burke. I'll see you later at the hotel. Make the book have a bloody ending. I'm in the mood for a good murder tonight. Remember, Jack, I warned you. Goodbye. Money, 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 gentlemen. Place your bets. I, uh... I told the croupier you wanted to see him back here, fat man, but it wasn't the croupier's fault the American broke the bank. That is for me to decide. Uh, where is the American now? Outside. Buying drinks for the house. Good, good. That ought to keep him busy. You... You called for me, monsieur? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I'll need you too, Cecilia. Uh, shut the door. I don't like to frighten our patrons. I'm... I'm sorry about the wheel, monsieur, but it was broken and I... I couldn't control it. That is unfortunate for you. What are you going to do, monsieur? Come here. Don't put your fat hands on me, fat man. Let me... Don't fight the fat man. You can't move, can you, croupier? Because if you move, my arm will break your neck. <laughs> Call my men, Cecilia. I might need a little aid with the stupid fool. What are you going to do, fat man? Have his brains pressed out of his body in room 16. His mind is no good where it is now. Oh, no, monsieur. Please, monsieur. Not room 16. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
What's that? What was that, Monsieur Laureate? We'll probably be luckier if we don't ask questions. I want another drink. Jack, listen to me. Put on your hat and coat and leave this place. You're being watched all the time. Who's watching me? Hello, Jack. Oh, have a drink. No, Jack. You've had enough to drink. Leave this place right away. She's right, Jack. You must leave. I'll see you home personally. Come on, then. Oh, no, you don't, Monty Laureate. I know your tricks. The last man you saw home was found with a dagger in his breast. How come you're so interested in me, Cecilia? Because you're the first person who ever treated me decent. Oh, please go home. All right. Sooner or later, every woman develops some mother complex over me. Now, I don't want to be mothered. Who is trying to mother you, my friend? Oh, hello, fat man. Cecilia is. Ah, she's developed a rather latent maternal instinct. I think a maternal instinct is out of place tonight. After all, uh, tonight's a night for celebration. Yeah, the fat man's right. Celebration. Bartender, open a bottle of champagne. Bartender, a uh, champagne. A uh, champagne for Monsieur Westcott. Uh, won't you join us, Cecilia? Yeah. Of course I will. Here is the champagne, Monsieur. Uh, won't you drink with us, Monsieur Lauriard? No, thank you, fat man. I don't think so. I never enjoyed toasting to death. Death? <laughs> Open the bottle, bartender. Good night, Jack, and good luck. Good night. Good night, good night, good night, good night. Here's the handkerchief, fat man. Oh, Jack, your money is all tied safely in your handkerchief. Thank you, friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, where'll I put the handkerchief? It would be wisest to tie it uh, to your belt. I, I feel dizzy, fat man. Oh, you need a cup of good hot coffee. That will straighten you right out. Uh, Cecilia, go in the kitchen and fix our friend a cup of coffee. But I, I really... Don't tell me, my little pigeon, that your hearing is failing you. I'll get it right away. I'm glad we're alone, fat man. I want a chance to talk to you. Talk away, Jack. Uh, tell me confidentially. Why do you enjoy seeing a mutilated body dragged out of the river? There's beauty in death. In the act of death? Or in the recovery of a body after life has left it? In both. Then do you enjoy committing a crime? Perhaps. Perhaps it would be pleasant to watch a man die. Slowly. Very slowly. In order to see life leave the body. Say that uh, you and I watched uh, a murder by pressure. What would happen? Ah, I'm interested, fat man. What would happen? The face is the first part affected. It would turn red. And the victim would probably feel hot blood pounding in his brain. Pounding like steel hammers. Mm -hmm. Then his eyes would feel sore. As if the fluid creating sight were ebbing. Slowly away. That would be painful? Painful but glorious. His face would discolor. The pressure on his chest would be so great he... He'd try to scream, cry out, but he couldn't. He wouldn't be able to move. Not a limb, not a muscle. He'd be paralyzed. I'd see to that. And in that moment, all the horror that is in man's mind... would be indelibly imprinted on the brain... until a sudden crushing noise would blot out thought. And what would that crushing noise be? The pulverizing of the human bone. Here's the coffee, fat man. Ah, let me see it. Hmm, tastes all right. Here you are, Jack. This will fix you. I... No, I don't think I want any. If you pardon me, I... I'm so dizzy. So frightfully dizzy. Oh, of course you are. Here, Jack, drink it. Drink it, my friend. My good, good friend. If you don't want to drink it, that Jack, don't, don't. Uh, open your mouth, my friend. It will sober you very quickly. No, I... Open your mouth. No. There. Now, how do you feel? I... I'm sick. I'm sick. It's dope, isn't it? It's dope. Let me... Oh, our friend Jack is asleep, Cecilia. Call the bartender. I think our friend will spend the night with us in room 16. Sir Manning! Sir Manning! 
I've been looking all over Paris for you, monsieur. You've been looking for me? Yes, I've called every hotel in the city trying to find you. I know you don't remember me, but I met you earlier this evening at the LaBelle Tavern. My name's Lauriard of the Paris Police Force. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Well, won't you come in? Where's uh, Mr. Westcott? I had to leave him at the tavern. He wouldn't listen to me. You see, monsieur, I've been assigned to watch that tavern. It's been under suspicion for several weeks. Oh, great Scott, man. Where's Jack now? At the tavern. He's carrying an enormous amount of money on his person. I know the fat man will never allow him to leave with that money. Why don't you raid the den? Unfortunately, we can't. We have no proof. As a matter of fact, they might not harm him at all. But just in case, I thought it might be a wise idea for you to go down there. You can go to the door and ask for... Yes? What do you want? You're the bartender, aren't you? I am not Napoleon's grandma. What do you want? My friend Jack Westcott hasn't come back to the hotel as yet. We've been waiting for him, and I thought that he probably decided to spend the night here at your place, and I... Your friend is not here. Go home, American, before you get yourself in more trouble than you can handle. Who was it? The other American asking about his friend. Where are you going? Upstairs. To take Monsieur Westcott a candle, like the fat man told me. Be sure the fat man told you, or else... I'm sure. Very sure. Jack. Jack, I... I brought you a candle. Are you asleep? Wake up, Jack. Please wake up. Please. Maybe if I shake him. Wake up. Oh, I hate to slap you, but your life depends on it. Uh, oh, what is it? Oh, wake up, wake up. Cecilia, <gasps> dear. Jack. Jack. Hmm. Luckily, he's still asleep. Come, Cecilia. Let our friend sleep. I'm so sick. So dizzy and sick. Why didn't she let me sleep? Oh, I feel paralyzed. I, I can't move at all. Just as if I'm drugged. Maybe if I concentrate on the room, I'll go to sleep. Funny. Funny that a French gambling house should have a bedroom. What is an old English four-poster bed doing in a French room anyway? What a heavy canopy over my head. So solid looking. Almost as if it were made of steel. The mattress is so hard. I must concentrate on something. The picture above my head is just even with the canopy. Oh, an evil-looking Spaniard with five feathers in his head. <gasps> the eyes moved. I'm certain of it. The eyes moved. Oh, I wonder if I dare look up again. I, I was sure there were five feathers. Now there are only four. Four feathers. Four feathers. Now three feathers. I wonder who's outside my door. I'll try to sleep. No, no, look at the picture. What? The feathers have disappeared. I can barely even see the face. Oh! God, Aaron. The canopy is being lowered on me. That's what it is. The canopy. It can't move. The paper thin corpse. Oh, I, I gotta move it. It's coming closer. 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 Oh, the, the squash me. Oh, I must move. I, I can't go. It's, it's almost down. Halfway down. Go. Oh, I, I. I move. Oh, just to crawl out of bed. Oh, if I get a cold, I crawl out of here. I. I Oh, I'm safe. Safer than that horrible contraption. Oh, I'm not to get out of here. The window. Open the window slowly. I'll crawl to the window. Now, if I can push the window open slowly, very slowly. The bed must be flat down on him by now. Listen to me, men. Push the window open. It's stuck. Be sure and deliver the money back to me. Uh, there. 
Not allowed to open it wide enough to crawl through. You can raise the canopy now. Next go in, gentlemen. Help! Help somebody! Get Help me! Get that man before he jumps out the window! Help! Save somebody! We've got him! Help! Shut the window! Oh. If the bed didn't work the first time, Mr. Westcott, I've ways and means of making it work the second, and perhaps it would be more pleasant to watch life ebb out in front of me. No, no. Place him carefully on the bed. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Good. This ought to prove most enjoyable, Mr. Westcott. It's a pity you haven't my detached viewpoint. Let me go. Put him in. Then lower the canopy. No, no, no. 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 This way, Bert. Out this no. way. Hurry, Mr. Lurie. I want you to the bed, Ruben. Cecilia, you fool. Look. Get Jack out of that bed. Jack, Jack, boy, here. Hold on to me. I'll drag you out. Don't you put your hand on me, Larry. Watch him there. That'll take care of the bottom. Oh. 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 I'm all right, Burke. Don't worry about me. I'm oh, Cecilia. I'll help her. Let me go, Cecilia. Don't push me. Help me, Larry. Help, help. No, you don't, fat man. You little. No, you don't. You're on to make me a Frankenstein. Well, Inspector Duval, that's the story. Boriard and Burke were waiting outside all the time. They saw me at the window, and Cecilia let them in. Mm, close shave, eh? A lucky escape. Boriard and I had pulled him out of the bed just in time, and Cecilia pushed the fat man under the canopy as it closed down. It must have been a horrible sight, Burke. Well, what about Cecilia, Inspector? What would they do to her? Unfortunately, the police can't find her. <laughs> and I've instructed them not to look too hard. <laughs> We have heard the story, A Terribly Strange Bed. Dell Keeper, toll the bell. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? Fred Adams is an attorney, a promising young attorney. Fred is a specialist, for his practice has been limited to nightclubs and bars. In other words, Fred is what is called a mouthpiece. He steps gaily down the street tonight, unaware of the two men leaning against the black sedan parked in the shadows between the lampposts. Hi, Fred. What's your hurry? Huh? Oh, hello, Joe. What are you and Mike doing in this end of town? We're waiting for you, Fred. 
Thought you might like to take a little ride. Ride? Yeah, the boss wants to have a little talk with you, Fred. Well, not tonight. I'm busy. Got an appointment. The boss would like to talk with you, Fred. Get in. I told you I'm busy. I'll drop around tomorrow. What are you so busy about, Fred? <laughs> How'd you like a poke in the nose? Get in the car, Fred. Let go of me, your hood. We ain't kidding. Get in. What would you two guys do without a gun? Get in. Okay, okay. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, Fred makes his way through the crowded tables of the swank Tripoli Cafe toward a door marked manager. He hesitates a moment, glances at the two men beside him, and knocks. Across the room, a beautiful woman sits behind the desk, toying with a long cigarette holder. Come in, Freddy. Come in. Well, we got him, boss. And uh, where do you think he was? <laughs> Over on Park Avenue. <laughs> How fancy. Wait outside, Joe. I want to talk to Freddy. Alone. <laughs> yeah. Sit down, Fred. Well, what's wrong? You in trouble again, Gloria? Would it matter to you if I were in trouble? Of course it would. Where have you been the past week? Has it been a week since I saw you last? You know it has. And a week is too long to suit me, Freddy. Well, you know my phone number. If anything had happened, you'd have found me. Doesn't make me very happy to think I have to go out looking for you. Kind of let me down. Oh, for the love of Pete, what happened? Nothing's happened here at the cafe. Well, what's the matter, then? It's you, Fred. It's what you've done. I haven't done anything. Why do you think I paid your way through law school? Well, because you wanted to. <laughs> and because you needed a lawyer around. Is that all? I don't know. I thought we were together in this thing for keeps. We well, are. Yeah. I'm still your attorney. What else do you expect of me? You have the nerve to sit there and say that. You know how I feel about you. You've always known. We've always been pals, good friends. Pals? Friends? Oh, Freddy. Now, what are you trying to say? I knew for the past three weeks that you had changed. Couldn't figure it out. But I found out this afternoon. Here it is in the paper. District attorney's daughter to wed young lawyer. Well, what about it? Are you really in love with me, Fred? Certainly. Why shouldn't I be? I don't think you are. I knew you were campaigning for the DA in this last election. I know you're ambitious. I think you've got your eyes on a job in the DA's office, more than you have on the girl. I tell you, I love Brenda Gibson, and you can think whatever you like. Is she pretty? Very pretty. Young. I don't like the way you said that, Fred. I'm not so old. I didn't mean it that way. You're a very beautiful woman, Gloria. Am I? But, well, I don't know what it is. You've done everything in the world for me. No one could ask for more. And I've always cared more for you than any woman I've ever known. Until now. But there's something about Brenda. That, well, she's so different. Go on. I hate to say this to you, but I've got to make you understand. Brenda's intelligent. She comes from a fine family. She has... Well, she has culture. And I came up from the chorus. Now, Gloria, I didn't expect you to take it this way. Well, how did you expect me to take it? I didn't think you were really in love with me. It never occurred to me that you had any ideas about... about marriage. What do you think I am, a totem pole? I looked at our association more as... well, as a business arrangement. You financed me through school, and when I got up in the money, I'd... I'd pay you back. Oh, Fred, I... Don't say any more. I know I've been blunt. But how else can I tell you? What else can I say? There's nothing you can say. But I'll tell you something. You're getting out of your element. You don't belong there. You belong here with me. And if you marry her, you'll live to regret the day you met her. Now, look. Don't be like that. Don't be a hard loser. You'd be better off dead. You don't mean that, Gloria? No. No, Fred, I, I didn't mean that. Oh, darling, please go. Before I say any more, I know I haven't a chance, but I... Please go. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Bye, Fred. I'll be seeing you. Goodbye, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
a week later, the papers are filled with stories and pictures of Fred and Brenda and the district attorney, and parties and dinners and teas. Read them, Gloria. Pour over them. Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams this, and Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Adams that. Read them, Gloria. Read them and weep. Meanwhile, on a train to Miami... And Fred, darling, after we spend a few days in Miami, we can fly over to Nassau. Father has a place there, and I know some wonderful people. We can have a great time. Fred? Hmm? Oh, what did you say? <laughs> Snap out of it, darling. We're on our honeymoon. <laughs> yes, Brenda, I'm sorry. I know we're going to have a swell time. My sister Nella's spending the summer at Nassau. Why didn't Nella come home for the wedding? She was to be your bridesmaid. I told you, dear, you can't always get transportation just when you want it these days. After all, Nella's your only sister. She could have made an extra effort, hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, business. Business? <laughs> what business? I was thinking about my new job. Uh, how did your father have to make a place for me in the DA's office? Mm, I suppose he thinks you were a capable young attorney. Did, uh, did you ask him to appoint me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I may have had something to do with it. Yeah. Oh, I wanted you to start out right. You don't mind, do you? Certainly not. It was swell of you. I only hope I can make good. You will. And who knows, maybe you'll be the district attorney yourself someday. I hope so. At least I'll break my neck trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's forget about everything for the next two weeks, but I... Oh, I love you so very much, Brent. Darling, I'll spend all my waking moments trying to make you happy. Thanks, dear. You'll never regret the day you met me. What did you say? You said you'd never regret the day you met me. Oh. I should say I won't. Not a chance in a million... Now the happy honeymoon is over, and Fred and Brenda are back home. Fred is in the district attorney's office and progressing nicely. But Gloria, poor Gloria, still sits in her office at the Tripoli and broods over her fate. She scans every item in the society columns, searching for news about Fred and Brenda. And every item, every picture nurtures her resentment. <laughs> and her resentment slowly turns to hate. And finally something snaps in her mind and she begins to harbor thoughts of revenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> revenge. Joe! Joe! Yeah? What are you yelling about, Gloria? I wasn't yelling. Close the door. Well, it sure sounded like yelling to me. I said I wasn't yelling. Okay, okay. I apologize. No, sit down. Oh, look, Gloria, what's eating you? Why don't you get out of this office? Go out and visit with the customers the way you used to. Why should I? Well, they all miss you. They're all asking, where's Gloria? I run out of excuses. I didn't call you in here to talk about the business. Well, maybe not, but I thought it was time I said something. Where's the evening paper? I uh, didn't get it. Why not? Oh, look, Gloria, snap out of it, will you? Why don't you quit hunting for news about Fred? You're only driving yourself nutty. Fred was a nice guy, but he's gone. He's married. Forget him. I can't. Well, you could try. It's not as easy as that. After all, he ain't the only man walking around. There's one or two others, you know. Yeah? Well, <clears throat> there's one guy in particular who might get your mind off Fred, uh, if you'd give him a chance. Yeah? Who? Well, uh, oh, I know I'm not as good-looking as Fred, and I ain't got his fancy manners. But I like you just as much as he did, probably a lot more. Sorry, Joe. At least I wouldn't walk out on you for any other dame. If you did... I wouldn't blame you. No? No. I'd blame the other woman. She had no right to take him away from me. He belonged to me. Oh, Gloria, please, please forget no, it. No, I won't. I can't. I've made up my mind. Huh? What are you thinking? Where's your car? Outside. Where's your gun? In my pocket. Some people are giving a party at their country place tonight for Fred and his wife. But, Gloria... But Fred was called out of town on business. They're giving the party anyway. And she'll be there. Brenda will be there. So what? We'll wait for her. And follow her when she leaves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Nothing doing. I ain't bumping off no woman. Sit down and shut up. You're crazy. You're gone absolutely nutty. I'm getting out of here. You're driving me to that house. I won't. No? I wonder if the police would be interested in knowing who killed Lefty Hammond. Gloria, oh, you wouldn't. <laughs> wouldn't I? Well... Okay, okay, you win. Better. Go get in your car. I'll go out the back way and meet you in the alley. And now.
now, back to the whistler. Gloria and Joe sit in the car in the deep shadows of a spreading tree. The hours drag on, and then about 1.30 in the morning, the party breaks up and the cars begin to leave. Finally, Brenda comes through the gate, driving her own coupe. There she is. That's Brenda. Get going, Joe. Is she alone? Yes, she's alone. I sure wish you'd change your mind. Don't get too close to her. No, I ain't got nothing against her or Freddy either. What good's this gonna do you? You wouldn't understand. I think you've gone off your beam. Maybe you're cracked. Shut up. I'm not crazy if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Drop back a little. They say crazy people never think they're baddie. You might feel different about this in the morning, Gloria. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. Oh! Cut it out. Cut it out. What do you get off slapping people? Move along. They're losing her. Well, lay off that rough stuff. Or I might decide to change my mind about the whole thing. Ah, you won't change your mind. It'd be funny if something happened to you. If anything happens to me, there's a letter in my safe that tells all about you. So you better see that I get back to the Tripoli. Okay, okay. I was only kidding. Hell. We're coming along to that long stretch now. No cars behind us and none coming. Step on it now. Run her off the road. Now, run her off in that ditch. Say, what's the idea? Are you trying to wreck me? Get out of that car. What is this, a holder? Get out and shut up. I haven't anything but a couple of rings. Take a rings, Joe. Well, this is a new one, a woman bandit. Any money in your purse? A few dollars. Take the money and scatter the rest of the things around. Yeah, yeah. Now, ruffle up her hair, Joe. Muss her up. You take your hands off me. Oh, have a heart, Gloria. Okay, okay, I muss her up, but good. Look, <laughs> are you? Think your hands... What's the meaning of this? Look, you've got what you want. Why don't you let me alone? I'll let you alone, Mrs. Adams. Who are you? Start walking. What? Start walking off through those trees. I won't. Oh, stop, stop. Get it. moving. What are you going to do? See to it that you don't do any more chiseling in, Mrs. Fred Adams. I don't know what you're talking about. What? Let her have it, Joe. Now, what are you stalling for? You missed her. Give me that gun. Well, and that's the last of Mrs. Adams. She's... She's dead. Yeah. There's a gun. Now, let's get out of here. Oh. Well, what's the matter? What are you waiting for? I... I'm kind of dizzy. Kind of sick. I can't drive, Gloria. You better drive. <laughs> and I thought you were experienced at this business. If I hadn't seen you do it, Gloria, nobody in the world could have made me believe it. Nobody. <laughs> Anything about it in this morning's paper, Joe? No. No, not a thing about it. And it was the night before last, too. I I can't understand it. Are you... Are you sure she was dead? Of course I'm sure. Oh, what do you suppose could have happened? She couldn't have walked away. Say, maybe they haven't found her or the, or the car yet, huh? Ah, it's impossible. At the main highway, hundreds of cars passed there in the course of a few hours. Oh, well, maybe they've seen the car but just thought it was a wreck. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Hey, you better lay off that stuff, Joe. You've been drinking for two days now. Yeah, but I need it. I'm jittery. I got the willies like I never had before. Say, maybe I ought to drive by that place and see if the car's gone, Okay, huh? okay. Get back as soon as possible. Yeah, 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 sure. I can't get it off my mind. I, I don't mind telling you. I, I'm scared. Go on, go on. And quit talking so much. Gloria. Gloria, I went out there. Yeah, well, I know, I know. What did you see? Nothing. Nothing. The car was gone. I looked all around for the spot. There wasn't a sign of anything. No trickets, no blood marks, no nothing. Well, then, then he must have found her. <laughs> but why don't they say something in the papers about it? If they just said something, I, I could stand it. It's driving me nuts. Are you going to lay off that stuff? No, no, I ain't. I, I need it. I don't need it. Yeah? I don't know what you're made of, but whatever it is, it's sure tough. I never knew a woman could be as tough. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Ah, you're a jellyfish. I can understand one guy rubbing out another one for doing something against the gang, but... I never thought I'd see a woman do a thing like that. And for no good reason. There was a reason. And shut up. I couldn't have done a thing like that. You could have turned me in first. There she was. Laying there, covered with... Shut up. 
funny, this stuff. Don't seem to have any effect on me. It's just like some water. Get hold of yourself. Poor kid. <laughs> I never felt so miserable in all my life. Did you get the late papers? Yeah. Here you are. Well, anything in it? No. No? Not a word. Hey, maybe. Maybe we didn't do it, Gloria. Maybe it was just a nightmare. No, we did it all right. And proper. If I don't hear something soon, I'll go crazy. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What is, what is it? Did they find her? No. Well, what do you know about that? Well, what is it? What is it? Look at this picture. Holy smoke. It's her. It's her. Her and Fred. Mr. and Mrs. Fred Adams attend the races. When? When? Yesterday. It isn't possible. But it's her. I know it's her, Gloria. How could she? She's dead. Hey. Hey. What's the matter? Maybe. Maybe it's her. Her ghost? Don't be silly. I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving town. Look. You're in the other paper. Huh? Day before yesterday. Fred Adams and wife attend tennis match. And another picture. What could this mean? What did they say something about it? You see? You see, Gloria, it's getting you down, too. Please, please, Gloria, let's pull out. It's not canny. I can't believe it. If it's in the papers, you've got to believe it. Did you double-cross me, Joe? What? what do you mean? Did you have blanks in that gun? Blanks? I'd certainly hate to get hit with what I had in that gun. She's dead, I tell you. But she better be. What do we do? You'll wait. That's all. Just wait. Okay. But I don't think I can stand it, Gloria. I'm going to pieces. <laughs> They did wait. They waited for two more days, and Joe, fortified with his bottle, was able to hang on. <laughs> then Gloria began to crack under the strain of waiting. Joe, I, I can't stand it any longer. i got to do it. Do what? I'm going to call Fred's apartment to see if she's there. I wouldn't. Hello? Is this the Adams apartment? Is Mrs. Adams there? Uh... An old friend from out of town. Yeah, thank you. She's there. Holy gee. She, she answered. Oh. I heard her. You lied to me, Joe. I didn't lie. I didn't. I had bullets in that gun. I saw her and she was dead. There's something wrong. Terribly wrong. I'm going to wait a few more days. I'll check again. And when I'm sure... I'm going to take care of you, Joe. What do you mean? I'm going to kill you. That's crazy. I don't think it would be safe to have you walking around and talking. Gloria, listen, listen. Come on, we're going to my apartment and wait. The story's bound to break sooner or later. I, I'd rather get out of town. You're coming with me to my apartment. Get moving. <laughs> then three more days of sleepless waiting. The tenseness grows and grows. Suspense is almost stifling. Poor Joe can neither sleep nor eat, and Gloria becomes pale and drawn. Then Joe finally emerges and goes on a little scouting tour about town to see what he can learn. Then on the next night, a knock at Gloria's apartment door. Who? Who is it? It's me, Fred. Fred? Wait a minute. Hello, Gloria. What do you want, Fred? May I come in? I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, of course. Come in. It's rather late, but, well, I had to talk to you. What about? <laughs> Never expected to see you around here again. Well, I was lonely. I had to talk to someone. Lonely? Well, sit down, Fred. Thanks. You look kind of tired, Gloria. What's wrong? Well... Since you mentioned it, you, you look a bit weary yourself. What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing much. I sent you a check clearing up what I owed you. Did you get it? No. There's something wrong, Fred. What is it? Your home. A little trouble, that's all. It's all the trouble. Domestic? Domestic? Tr what? what do you mean? I, but that isn't... It isn't possible? Is that what you're going to say? Yes, I, I thought you were quite happy with your wife. Well, things can develop suddenly. I certainly found that out. Well, what happened? 
Or do you want to tell me? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. I guess that's why I came here. You're always so darn understanding. You always knew the answers to things. But what happened? Well, I guess I really didn't belong in the upper crust. You had it figured out about right. Everything was all right until Brenda started to shape my career. Shape your career? Yes. She had everything all planned out for me. She and her father had it all figured out. I wanted to go into the DA's office and move up on my own initiative. They didn't want it that way. They wanted me to start out as a big shot. Did she leave you? Uh, yes, yes, we just agreed to disagree. Oh. Well, where is she now? Her father's place, I suppose. But when did she leave? Yesterday. Yesterday. Are you sure it was yesterday? Of course. Why do you ask that? Well, no reason, I suppose. I just can't believe it. It seems a shame. Well, I'm really sorry for your friend. Believe me. I know how you feel. I was let down with a dull thud once. Were you? You should know. Oh, Gloria, I was such a fool. You were right. I should have listened to you. You could see what was coming, and I was too dumb to realize it. Have you forgiven me? Yeah. Now, Fred, I'd have to forgive you. I love you so much. I've never been able to forget you for one single moment. I'm sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. Fred, I... I've got a strange feeling. I don't know what it is, but... I've got a feeling you're not telling me the truth. What? You mean you don't believe me? There is something you haven't told me. What is it? Why, why, nothing. I've told you everything. I don't believe you, Fred. All right. Gloria, I, I'm... Well, I'm in a tough spot. Brenda hasn't gone away. She, She's dead. Dead? What on earth do you mean? Yeah, she was found dead beside a car a number of days ago. The day after we had a nasty argument, but I didn't do it. There have been many threats against the district attorney and members of his family, and it may have been any one of a number of persons. Nothing's been said about it in the paper. I know that, I know it. They purposely kept it quiet, hoping the real killer would show his hand. Well, that's silly. Why should he? I don't know. Oh, darling, it's all a mess. I'm completely worn out over it. I know they suspect me. I don't know what to do about it. Gloria! Gloria! I seen her. I seen her. Who? She was standing under the lamppost at the corner. She spoke to me. She said, Hello, Joe. How's, how's Gloria? Shut up, you're drunk. No, 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 it was her. It was Brenda. I ran for the elevator, and as the doors closed, she was coming into the lobby. She was terrible. Oh, pale and awful looking. You're simple, and you got the snakes. No, no, it was her. And she's coming up here. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. It's her. It's her. I, I do want to see her. I can't look at her. I, I can't stand it. Joe, turn on the lights. I won't. I won't. Turn on those lights. Never mind the lights. Go. I can see you. All three of you. Brenda. What do you want? So you, Gloria. Yes. Yes, I met you for the first time not many nights ago on a deserted highway. Joe, it is her. <laughs> Come out of the corner, Joe. I can see you. <laughs> Joe, the man who pulled the trigger. I didn't. I didn't. What do you want? So, Fred, you were in on the plan, too. You wanted me out of the way because of Gloria. You were back of the whole thing. No, Brenda, no, no. I had nothing to do with it. You decided you'd made a mistake, that you wanted Gloria. I didn't. I swear I didn't. Tell him, Joe. Tell him how you shot me down. You had the gun. Tell him or I'll... No, no, no. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I'll tell. I'll tell. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. She did it. Gloria did it. I couldn't. I didn't have the nerve. He's lying. I didn't do it. Go ahead, Joe. Spill it. I ain't going to take the rap for this. Gloria went off her beam when you married Brenda. She went crazy with jealousy. She knew about that party, and she made me drive her out there. We followed Brenda and then ran her off the road. She tried to make me do it, but I, I couldn't. I fired wild, and Gloria grabbed the gun from me and, and let her have it. She's lying. How could she make you do it? She threatened me. She's got something. Shut up, shut up! I don't care. She can tell what she knows about me, but I can prove that she killed Brenda. How can you prove it, Joe? I wore gloves. I still have the gun and the only fingerprints on it are Gloria's. You dirty little... I figured she might try to double-cross me. What about it, Gloria? All right. All right, I did it. I did it. I shot her. I couldn't stand it any longer. Turn on the lights, Joe. 
Hey, she ain't dead. It's her. It's her. Brenda ain't dead. Good Lord. Oh, yes. Brenda's dead, all right. Quite dead. And what is she? You'll find out, Gloria. What a strange quirk of fate. It was your money that caused all this. It was you who put me through law school so that I could defend you. But now, I'm sorry to say I'll be forced to be your prosecutor. Sorry, Gloria. Terribly sorry. <laughs> well, Gloria, you've come to the end of your rope. Things didn't work out as you planned. You really killed Brenda that night. But Fred got a brilliant idea. He had Nella, Brenda's twin sister, come up from Nassau and pose as his wife. That's how all the pictures appeared in the papers. And it was Nella who just walked in on you and got a confession. And how did Fred know you were the one? Well, there were several suspects. But you, Gloria, made the mistake of phoning for Brenda too many times. And the police traced your calls. <laughs> Too bad, Gloria. Jealousy is a terrible thing. Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William. And featuring Perry Ward, Lorene Tuttle, and an all star Hollywood cast. And the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Anger, jealousy, revenge, lust, envy, hate, and despair. And here is our distinguished star of radio, screen, and stage, Warren William. Of all the sins that live in the human heart, none is so deadly as despair. It has been truly spoken that when a man loses faith in his friends, his neighbors, and himself, he is truly in a sorry plight. Harry McNeil, the Prince of Broadway, on a certain night not long ago, learned the full bitter meaning of the sin of black despair. I'll tell you the story in just a moment, after we hear a word from your announcer. And now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Prince of Broadway. These are stories of strange wills made by strange people. Strange people whose last written chapter in the book of life is dominated by good or evil. The Prince of Broadway is the story of my friend Harry McNeil, actor's agent. But Harry was more than just an actor's agent. He had that uncanny genius of seeing talent where others couldn't, 
And once he took some talented youngster under his wing, he never stopped until his goal was reached. For ten years, he discovered and promoted new talent for his company, Artists Incorporated, and sent a steady stream of actors, singers, and dancers to successful careers and fame. And then, one day, he grew tired and quit his job. After an extended vacation in Bermuda, he came back to New York and opened a very small office in the heart of Tin Pan Alley. The very first chance I had, I dropped in at his new address to wish him success in his new venture. <laughs> this is my friend, the old mouthpiece in person. And do me a favor and park the tombstones outside, will you? <laughs> <laughs> no tombstones with me, Harry. <laughs> Just a social call and an invitation to lunch thrown in for good measure. Well, we'll skip the lunch today, John, if we may, but come on in, let's chew the fat. And uh, forget the dignity of the law, if that's possible. No, that's not only possible, Harry, but a pleasure. I'll bring you up to date on Broadway gossip, but uh, but uh, tell me, Harry, how did Artists Incorporated take your leaving? <laughs> not very graciously, I can assure you. They even offered me a vice presidency and a trunk full of shekels to stay on, but no soap. <laughs> I'm a free soul from now on. I'm going to be choosy. No more discovering butting genius. they got to have it when they come in or else. <laughs> or else what, Harry? Or else I don't want them, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> and lonely names now, Mr. Mouthpiece. <laughs> Look, see these gray hairs on my temple? That's what I got trying to put potential geniuses in marquee lights. <laughs> gray hair and ulcers at 29. <laughs> if I keep it up, where do you think I'll be at 39? Well, I'll tell you. You'll be filing my will in probate court, and for all I know, adding my will to your collection of strange wills <laughs> made by strange people. <laughs> oh, no, not for me. <laughs> you still give me a laugh in spite of your new resolutions. But I know you better than you think I do. Yeah? There's someone to see you, Harry. Uh, tell him to come back tomorrow. I'm busy. I didn't say it was a him. It's a her. Get what I mean? Well, um, uh, well... Uh, uh, maybe it's Alice Faye or Sonia Haney. <laughs> Honey, what's her name? Just a minute. <laughs> she says her name is Pulaski, Gertrude Pulaski. She has a letter for you from her singing teacher in Oshkosh. Gosh... I'm sending her in. Hey, wait, honey, wait. Oh. When Gertrude Pulaski stood in the doorway, neither Harry or I could take our eyes away from her. She must have been the inspiration of... Did you ever see a dream walking? Luxurious ash blonde hair fell in soft ringlets around her shoulders. Her eyes were the color of a deep purple violet. Her figure would have made even the great Ziegfeld take a second look. And her provocative smile, well... Hello. Oh, uh, come in, Miss Gertrude. Uh... Thank you. Well, Harry, if you'll excuse me, I'll be running. Oh, no, 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 don't go, John. This will only take a minute or two. Uh, Gertrude, I'm Harry McNeil. This is my good friend and attorney, John Francis O'Connell. Oh, it is a pleasure. How do you do? I know why you're here, Gertrude. You don't have to tell me. You want a career. Oh, yes. You want your name on Broadway. Yes. You want fame and fortune. But it's no use. I don't develop talent anymore. I only take names. People who have reputations. Oh. I'm sorry, but... Uh, but what, Mr. McNeil? But what... But, oh, but, but what will you sing, of course? You hear? <laughs> <laughs> Let me sit down at the piano. Now then, let's find a good number. You know this one? Yes, of course, and I'll play it, too. Good enough. Here, here. I'll, I'll move over. Uh, uh, room enough? More than enough. Now you can turn the pages for me. Hmm? <laughs> That'd be a pleasure. Hold it, just a minute. That's enough. Uh, look, uh, sugar, uh, let's relax and sing a little bit lower, will you? Now, this isn't an audition for the Met. These words were written right from some guy's heart, and I want you to sing them from your heart. Okay, move over and let me play it for you. Now, let's try it again. Hmm? Yes, Mr. McNeil. Okay. heard of racehorses kept under wraps until the day of the big race. Well, Harry McNeil went one better with the beautiful Gertrude Pulaski. Six months went by, six long months that had my imagination on edge, 
because I couldn't wait to learn what had happened to his newest discovery. He only gave me hints. But one morning, I received an invitation in the mail to attend the debut of Judy Morrison in a song recital at Harry McNeil's penthouse apartment the following Saturday night. Oh, exit Gertrude Pulaski. Enter Judy Morrison. The debut of a McNeil discovery was always one of the highlights for blasé columnists and important bigwigs. They were seldom, if ever, disappointed. Always the showman, Harry kept Gertrude, I mean Judy Morrison, out of sight until our natural excitement and curiosity reached a crescendo. And then, at exactly 11 o'clock, she made her triumphal entry. The girl was breathtaking. She wore a long, flowing, green evening gown that accentuated the ash blondness of her hair. Her charm and smile were devastating. Her poise was perfect. In appearance and demeanor, Judy Morrison was sensational. Well, now that you've all had a good look at Judy, she'll show you that beauty and appearance and voice are not incompatible. Judy, will you take over the keyboard, please? I don't know why I love you like I do. I don't know why I just do. I don't know why you thrill me like you do. I don't know why you just do. You never seem to want my romancing. The only time you hold me is when we're dancing. I don't know why. I love you like I do I don't know why I just do Well, Judy, you've seen how your friends and mine like you. Supposing you thank them in your own way. Of course I do thank you so very much. But... But you and I, all of us, have this night been privileged to worship at the altar of a genius. The genius of Harry McNeil. Everything that I am, that I may one day be, I owe to him. His unselfish love, his patience, his wisdom. His... I only wish that he loved me half as much as I love him. <laughs> From that night on, the ultimate success of Judy Morrison was an accepted fact. Harry arranged for her triumphal appearance at the world-famous Rococo Room. The papers were filled with stories about her. But the day before she was to open, a storm broke. Harry called me. It's serious, John. I don't want to tell you about it over the phone, but I need a good lawyer, and quick. I'll come over right away, Harry. When Judy came to my office that day, she had a letter for me. I forgot to ask her for it, and she forgot to give it to me. It was a letter from her singing teacher up in Ishkai. She addressed to Artists Incorporated, to my attention. You see, John, everything was wonderful until her teacher came into town to attend her opening. He went over to Artists Incorporated to thank them for what they had done, and then, bluey, they found out that Judy was their property. I'm accused of piracy. But much worse, John... They've succeeded in blackballing Judy from every top spot in the country. As long as I have her under my wing, Judy will never get a job. Hmm. I'm really sorry to hear this, Harry. Can't we make a deal with... No, no, it's out of the question. They hate me for pulling out and they're after my scalp. But, John, nothing, nothing must stand in the way of Judy's career. I've never told a living soul, much less Judy, but... But I'm in love with her. From the first day she stood in that doorway... I fell head over heels in love. Well, why don't you tell her? After all, marriage still comes before a career in my book. How do you know that Judy... Won't... No, no, John. You see, we belong in different schools. To us, the theater is theater. It transcends everything. The show's got to go on. Judy will be everything I plan for her to be. I'll tell you how I want it worked. Draw up my will. Well, what are you going to do? A Brody from Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> no, not that. 
I want you to will Judy Morrison, body and soul, to Artists Incorporated. Harry, you're talking like a fool. Well, if they own her, she'll go to town. She'll be where she belongs, on the top of the heap. And you, Harry? You know, John, I've held a pilot's license for five years. We're not in the war yet, but England is, and they need flyers. One more thing. I want your word that you'll never tell Judy what really happened. Tell her, yes, just say that, that I got tired of going on, that I did everything I could for her, and from now on she's on her own. I never thought that I'd live to see the day that you'd run out on Judy. You'll never know, John, how black, how bitter despair can be. If I have my way, you'll never see me alive again. <laughs> Part two of Strange Wills will follow in just a moment. Now back to the Prince of Broadway and Warren William. My friend Harry McNeil disappeared from the world of men. Meanwhile, under the banner of Artists Incorporated, Judy Morrison became an overnight sensation. One night, Judy called me and asked me to meet her at the Swank Ziegbro room, where she was currently appearing. I noticed a tenseness in her voice. John, I can't hold out any longer. I've got to know why... why Harry threw me over. It wasn't like him. Why is that important, Judy? Haven't you got what you wanted from life? Beauty, charm, talent, fame. You're the toast of Broadway. Values in life change, John, believe me. Nine months ago, I thought that was what I wanted. I thought that success was all that mattered. But I've changed... John, you never know what is in your heart until someone you once loved is gone. Now I know how deeply, how very deeply I loved Harry. It was because of him that I was able to reach this thing we call success. I know now that he was my inspiration. I want him, John. I want him with all my heart. But he's gone, Judy. He joined the RAF. That's all any of us know. He's never written a line to a single one of his friends. John, tell me, tell me honestly. Did he love me? Well, uh, really, You've got to tell me. You see, if Harry loved me, I'll search the world to find him just to sit at his feet. If he didn't, if he really tired of me, if I must abandon hope, then I'm going to marry Felix George, the vice president of Artists Incorporated. He proposed to me last night. I said I'd give him my answer tonight. If ever a man was saved with a bell, it was I. Judy was called to go on with her act, and I was left alone to ponder the question of legal ethics and love. I was sworn to silence by my client, and yet I wanted to tell Judy the truth. I want to dedicate my next number to a very great and gallant man. His name is Harry McNeil. And I know no matter where he may be, he'd like to hear the song I'm going to sing. You see, 
He taught me how to sing it. When my dream boat comes home, then my dreams no See, Mr. Consular, I put my cards on the table. I've got a little boat of dreams that I won't let go of. Listen, Judy. I'm going to do something I shouldn't. But I'm willing to live with my conscience in spite of my action. You're right. Harry loved you as no other human being ever will. Oh. He turned you over to Artists Incorporated because your singing teacher gave you a letter addressed to them. And by that letter, you belonged to them. What? They had you blackballed in every spot in town. And Harry did the greatest thing a real man ever did. He willingly and knowingly sacrificed his deep love for you in order that your ambitions would be realized. I knew it. I felt it all the time. Oh, John, why why didn't you tell me? I thought you wanted a career, Judy. I honestly did. Oh, John, men are such fools. Such fools. Judy's offer to entertain British troops was quickly and eagerly accepted. Within two months, she had arrived in London, and then she began her long search for Harry McNeil. Meanwhile, at home, events moved with startling rapidity. Then there came that day of infamy, December 7th, 1941. I received my commission as Captain U.S. Infantry and was assigned to legal duties in the Provo Marshal's office in London. Three days after my arrival, I had lunch with Judy at the Savoy. I think he's dead, John. And yet I won't be satisfied until I'm positive. He's listed as missing in action, and his squadron commander told me that... that he was shot down in flames over Berlin. (laughs) Oh, don't give up, Judy. I've always believed in a sort of special providence that watches over people in love. No, I won't give up. I'll keep right on searching if it takes me the rest of my life. Then came D-Day. France was liberated. World-stirring events followed in rapid succession. Germany was invaded. The Battle of the Bulge and the end was nearing. And then the news we had all been waiting for, Germany surrendered. But as the war came to its inevitable end, Judy became more disconsolate. Though she searched every hospital in Europe, no trace was ever found of a Major McNeil. He had disappeared. Judy and I met once more in Munich. I hardly recognized her when I called for her at her billet. Her eyes were sunken. She was pale and wan, and the emotional strain she'd been under these past years was indelibly etched on her face. It's all over, John. My hopes are run out. There's nothing left for me now but to go home. Judy, you've done everything a human being could possibly do under these conditions. You're tired, young lady. You must go back immediately. Yes, I know. I've made arrangements to fly to London tomorrow. And then it's back to New York. It's too bad, Judy. Yes, John, I guess my little boat of dreams is finally founded. What time is it, please? Why, uh, it's 3.30. Would you be a kind man and take a ride with me? Where to? On my last appearance. I'm scheduled to sing at a little hospital just outside of Oberammergau. I understand that most of the patients are blind. I'm at your service, Judy. And if you will permit me to say so, I consider it an honor and a privilege. He 
have only about 60 patients. They are nationals of every country in the war. Are they all blind, Doctor? Most of them. But we have about 20 who are psychopathic cases. We are especially happy that you have come, Miss Morrison. You see, we have learned that musical therapy is very beneficial as a means of recovery. Mm. In many instances, our medical knowledge is of little value. Uh, well, if you are ready... You come too, John, won't you? Of course, if I can be of help. Uh, come this way, please. <laughs> our piano survived the war, but I'm afraid it's badly out of tune. Uh, here we are. Many of them are seriously wounded as well as blind. Oh, John, how horrible. Frau Zimmerman will accompany you. You have your music? Oh, yes, Doctor, here it is. I'll walk around the room as I sing. You see, Doctor, I'm looking for a certain soldier... In fact, I've been looking now for almost four years. Uh -huh. He's listed as missing in action. Uh, what is his name? McNeil. Major Harry McNeil of the Royal Air Force. I am sorry, Miss Morrison, but our records do not show... Yes, I know. I've heard that from London to Berlin. But I'm still looking. When my dream boat comes home then my dreams no more will roam. I will meet you and greet you, hold you closely, my own. Judy sang her heart out to those boys just as she'd done month after month, year after year. She visited every bed, looking, hoping, praying. Many of the patients were swathed in bandages from head to foot. How she ever hoped to identify Harry was beyond understanding. But as she stood there, literally singing with eyes full of tears, she was a picture I'll never forget. The late afternoon sun came streaming into the room and formed an aura of light over her head. She looked like and was an angel of mercy. Oh, John, my last hope is gone. Take me home, please. We walked slowly to the door. Her head was bowed. Judy was crying softly. Just as we reached the door, she stopped. She turned and took a last lingering look round the room. The sun had dipped even lower and shone across the beds of the wounded making long, grotesque shadows on the wall. And then we walked out through the door. Suddenly, Judy raised her head. Her eyes had a wild, startled look. She grabbed my arm and looked up into my eyes. John! John, the ring! I saw it! The ring! His ring! Oh, what a fool! She turned and ran back into the room, ran to the bed of a man swathed in bandages from head to foot. Only his hands were showing. And on his finger, I saw the ring. A black onyx stone that caught the last faint shimmer of sunshine. Judy was kneeling at the bed, sobbing as only a desperate love can sob. I found you, Harry. I found you. He stood love. silently by, watched through tear-filled eyes. We saw the hand of our brave and blind Major Harry McNeil close tenderly over hers. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story of The Prince of Broadway. But first, here is a word from your announcer. And here again is Warren William. Judy and Harry were married the next day, and I had the honor of being present at the bedside ceremony. Harry was invalided back to the States and is now living with Judy on a little farm in Connecticut. Judy, of course, after her long and meritorious service record, is again the toast of Broadway. And Artists Incorporated, in spite of Harry's protests, have elected him a vice president 
and have his office ready for him as soon as he is able to return. And so two wonderful young people found out that the theater and love are not only compatible but necessary for a complete happiness. And Harry's famous will... <laughs> well, I just added it to my collection of strange wills. Next week, I'm going to tell you a story about a last will that started a treasure hunt on the floor of the ocean for a king's ransom in rubies, diamonds, and pagan gold. The log of the Spanish three-master, Toledo, was washed ashore on a desolate West Indies island through modern science and the skill of a beautiful young forensic chemist. The last position of the ship was discovered. Discovered not only by Captain Paul George, courageous young American, but unfortunately by the desperate crew of an ex-German U-boat who had fled Germany at the end of the war. What took place at the bottom of the ocean is a thriller that I promise you won't forget for a long time to come. We call this strange story Treasure to Starboard. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Produced by Alonzo D. Cole. The Witch's Tale. <laughs>
With a cask of rum, I gave them leave to open their way left. They're not apt to be curious about their captain's whereabouts. You're the slick one, Dandy. Uh, soon we must return to them. They're happy now, but in another hour, they'll cut each other's throats. Which would be unfortunate. But when we stay at daylight, we shall want a crew. I get all of them. If we'd overhaul the English brigantine. The news we have be true, that should be within the week. And she's loaded with bullion, Dandy. Bullion. <laughs> And when we see her, our crew can divide the cargo while you and me, their captains, take the gold. To add to that, which Ling and Frenchie bury now beneath the gibbet. Think it's safe there? Most safe. For there, we are ever assured of guardians for our treasure. <laughs> you mean our bony friends who squeak so in their chains as they dance upon the wind? <laughs> Aye. If one suspected that beneath their dead and dangling feet lay something worth the taking, he would still hesitate to argue its possession with such ghostly bankers. Well, but we should have come here alone, just you and me, to hide this stuff. My dear Jack, with pistol and cutlass, you have your points, but you'll never make a gentleman. What do you mean? You forget that they're turning, uh, pirates. I had what is sometimes called breeding. Think you I would soil my hands by digging in the earth with a filthy spade as our comrades there are doing? And I would have done it alone if you must protect your lily hands and keep dirt from your fine clothes. And back to the ship you would have gone looking like one who had been digging. I hadn't thought of that. There are times, my dear Jack, when I don't believe your brains were made for thinking. Oh, I'm thinking now that we let these two dig for us into our secrets. Oh, I trust Ling and Frenchie absolutely. They'll never breathe a word. What's come over you? You trust no one. It's finished, Captain Burgess. Ah, ah. the last bed for it. Have you tapped it down so there's no sign of fresh turned earth? Say for yourself, Jack Gore. If they had not watched it being done, even those artists who dance above would not suspect. You have done very well, my good boys. Now back to the ship where warm rum awaits. And mind you, not a word of this or I'll cut your gullet. Oh, Jack, please. I trust these good boys. Hey, go ahead with your spades, Ling and Frenchie. We shall follow. Aye. Aye. Oh! <laughs> Dandy, you shot them. And my aim was a miss. One had time to scream. Mm, both dead. You didn't tell me it was your plan to kill these men. I told you they would bear no tails. You were a devil, Dandy Burgess. And you were a fool. Too soft-hearted for our profession. I may be a fool. But I'll never turn my back to you, as those two did. <laughs> you fear me. You, whose huge hands could crush my puny bones to jelly. I, when I'm sober, as an Indian, they fear the cobras. You flatter me. Look, you. You're as full of greed as I. Yonder in the ground lies a king's ransom. It's whereabouts unknown to all alive, but just we two. I had three pistols in my belt. Here on the ground, I throw the one still loaded. And there, my cutlass. I am disarmed if you would have the secret to yourself. As if I had wished your death, it could now be mine alone. Take, take back your weapons, Dandy. Oh, you're truly my friend, as I've always thought. Oh, yes, you big idiot. I don't know why. Perhaps it's because you're such a lout, a child, my opposite. Because you amuse me and, and admire me. Dandy, will you always be my friend, my brother? Will you swear it? If it will make you feel any better, what shall we swear by? We who do not fear the devil and have broken all the laws of God. I had not thought of that. No, you wouldn't. Oh, wait, wait. We'll swear by justice, the thing we both fear most. Justice is a silly word for schoolboys. But <laughs> since you wish it very well, we'll swear by justice, which for you and I means death upon this gallows tree. Aye, the hands upon the chain in which dangle those bleached out uh, Better yet, with our hands upon the corpses, we will swear. <laughs> Brother of the stretched neck, excuse the liberty. I grasp what was formerly your foot. I touched the body, too. By justice, by the gallows tree, by death we swear to be brothers, friends, inseparable, to share and share the life on earth or down in hell. I swear now you. 
Oh, I swear. No, now let's come away. The odor of our dancing friends is scarcely that of flowers. You must put our good boys, Ling and Frenchie, in the small boat, Jack. When we strike deep water, you can toss their bodies out. No one will see them in this darkness. Nay, a day like we sail. The English merchantmen and gold. Which we'll share and share alike. Which we'll share and share alike. <laughs> Jack, you're getting drunk. Sure, I'm drunk, whatever. Nothing except that rum is apt to cloud your usually excellent judgment. Uh, another drink, everybody. Another song. Give me Amsterdam milk. Jack, what? Captain Goy, a blasted wine. I dare you call me simple, Jack. I'm master here as well as Dandy Burger. <laughs> Now I know you're drunk, Jack. Well, hi, bung up that cast. What do you mean? We do no more drinking this night. Keep away from that cast, Will Hi. I said we do no more drinking this night. Jack Bowers, Master, here as well as you, Dandy Burgess. Jack said more wrong. Yeah, don't stop that silence. I and this pistol say no more. Did you hear me? Uh, 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 Uncock that pistol, Captain Burgess. Go to your post. All of you. The English merchant from London should be along tonight. She's armed, and in this fog, we must have our wits about us. Take your men to the guns, Dick Howell. Aye, sir. You, Hans Schwartz, say the grappling hooks are ready. Yeah. Say, sir, when you speak to me. Yeah. Sir. Get out on deck, all of you. (laughs) Captain Gore is giving his orders. Obey them, please. Mm, it's me can handle those villains, Dandy. Well, oh, now they're gone, you and me will have a drink alone, huh? I'll have one. You've gone your limit. What do you mean? Rum makes you overbold. Oh. <laughs> ah, very excellent, this rum. You will not look too longing if I have another jack. Thank you. <clears throat> ah, but liquor is emptiness and song is folly. Until the duet becomes a trio with fair women. Women. Or even uh, women. How your eyes shine, Jack. Candy, think you will be women on this merchant when we hope to see? Yes. Mayhap, if the uh, devil looks after his own. Oh, women. And for all your fine clothes and gentlemen's ways, I'll get the same as you. You've sworn we'll share and share alike. Hmm. Uh, with women, that might be inconvenient. You've sworn. Do not try to cheat me. Uh, don't worry, only we better cross that bridge when we come to it. No, we'll cross it now. I know you. You take him from me with your handsome fist. We'll cut these cards and see who gets first choice. <laughs> uh, very well. I'll shuffle them. I'll shuffle them. I wronged you greatly when I called you drunk. One cut, high cut. The one against gets first choice to the women on that break. Very well. Uh, cut! I've drawn a ten. I've drawn a knave. I win! You shuffle. The choice is mine, the women on that break. If any, and we cite it. Captain Burgess, the English merchantman. Good! Oh, the fog's just lifted. She's lying hard to port. Then she cited us! It's all right, you fool. Our master's flying the flag of Holland. Tell Dick Howell not to break out the guns. If she remains unsuspicious, we can drift close enough to grapple with the hook. I said, then we'll bother with a cutlass hand to hand. That's what I love. To fight. To kill. And when we have prisoners to torment, the sport begins for me. Come on, I'm dead. Hey, the here. Cut car. Breaking out a gun. She suspects us, eh? She's on fire. Give her back a broadside. Take down that flag of Holland and hoist the jolly rod. Here. I told you no women are aboard the ship. I'm afraid you have forgotten, Captain. 
Uh, to improve your memory, once more we'll try this red hot poker on your naked foot. Not again! <laughs> For God's sake, no! <laughs> Uh, it's too bad. He's fainted again. Stop it, Dandy. He couldn't tell his lies on a cane like that. Sit down and drink your rum. When we captured this brig, you had your fun of killing him. Now, I have my sport by making the survivors pray for death. Yeah, but can't you kill this man now and have it over with? We've got the gold. He showed us where it was when you strung his mates over the yard. But the minuet, they done. <laughs> yes, he's given us the gold. But he's yet to show us where the women hide. I don't believe there are any women. Ah, yes, there are. I found a woman's glove upon the deck. A woman's glove? And the woman must be on this ship. Ah, how astute you are. And I thought that liquor clogged your brain. Ah, our friend is coming to again. Women. They're all women. (laughs) Well, Captain, the poker has had time to heat once more. Is your memory better now? Use it again. No. <laughs> I'll tell you what you want to know. There are two. Two women? Hid. Back of my cabin. A panel there. Concealed. The secret door. Two, two women. women. No. Thank you, Captain. Very much. That last you shot. And my aim's improved. He never murmured like poor Frenchie. Come. Um. Two women find the man in his cabin, and I have my choice. I come, but uh, leave your bottle here, friend Jack. <laughs> the ladies might not like a uh, drinking man. <laughs> One more blow and I'll burst the panel. No, you may wait. Yay! Now, you fool. The women hear your act. They cower inside the wall. And hear what they know is coming. Oh, wait, dear Jack, and let them fear the long Hey, I want my price. I want a woman. Hey, you clod. If you know the light in that deadly terror. I have the light of a woman in my arms. And die of her tears. And back. Ah, back one the panel. scream. Ah. Good evening. Gentlemen. Well, for one, it's not you who screams. I'm not the kind who screams. My companion is there behind that curtain. Dead! A dagger in her breast. She was afraid of you, gentlemen. She preferred to die. And you preferred to live. With the spirits you have, my pretty one. How I shall delight to tame you. Not so fast, Dandy. <laughs> This woman is mine. I have the choice. Yeah, but the other is dead. And I chose the living. Yeah, don't be a fool, Jack. We are brothers. We've sworn to share and share alike. With women, you said that would be inconvenient. Stand aside. I want this woman, and what I want, I take. Now, this time, my pistol is pointed back. You're drunk. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I know. This woman goes with me. Come on, my beauty. Wait! I go with the master. And that's me. You! Take back. I'm not so drunk, Andy Burgess. You see, as we go through this door, I do not turn my back to you. (laughs) Really, little man, you're too amusing. Be careful. Do you think to frighten me? The week I've spent aboard this ship has quite accustomed me to pirates. Even the fearsome kind like Captain Gorn. The sort of cabin boys like you. You'll drive me too far. Listen, wench. I tell you that until the night we took you from that English brig, Jack Gore was my dog, my slave. That I was the master here alone. The possession of you has turned his head. So that now he tries to rule here in my place. If you would be master once again, why do you not take me from him? <sighs> I go with the master. So oh, you shall. And the master will be me. Hi, Dandy Burgess. Captain Burgess, you <laughs> dog. So you say. <laughs> Captain Gore says to keep away from his woman. You, mistress, he bids come to his cabin. His cabin, the swine. Where he sits, always facing the door with pistol cups and ready. He seems unwilling to ever turn his back to you, uh... Captain, <laughs> laugh. Laugh as you go to him, you. Always 
facing me. When tomorrow we enter Nassau Bay, I shall teach him to face all ways. Yet see me not. <laughs> and you, Mistress Kate, will find I am the master. <laughs> So you, Captain Sergius, will deliver to me with evidence of that piracy for the high seas, your former comrade? Yes, Governor Rogers. I will deliver them here on Nassau Bay and with evidence in plenty. For myself, I claim amnesty under His Majesty's wise pardon for those who repent their wrong and inform against the sinful. That I must grant you. It is the law. I hope you ask no other reward for putting these men within our grasp. Yeah, but I do. And make it part of our bargain. And our rest easy, it will not affect your treasury. There is a woman aboard that ship out there. I would place her in my care. And in her company, attend the hanging. You would attend the execution of the comrades you condemn? Not all of them. Only that of Captain Gore, my, uh, particular friend. As the wind turns his body in its gallows chains, I would watch him face all ways and see me nowhere. <laughs> Accordingly, past sentence that you, the said Jack Gore, be carried to prison from whence you came, and from thence to the place of execution, where you are to be hanged by the neck till you shall be dead. 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 And God have mercy on your soul. Dandy, you swore to be my friend, my brother. Humphrey, let's get out of here. Breathe the air. I go with master. You're nearly at the crossroads where you say your very treasure lies. I see the jetty there. I... How stark and alone it stands by night. Our friend Jack, who was hanged upon it yesterday, will be grateful for our company. Hear the creaking chains he swings in. He seems to cry well. Now, wait, wait. Why do you stop? Now, let's go back. If that dirty work to ply a spade, it goes against my grain to soil my hands. You want no one else in the secret of the treasure that you and he buried here so long ago? Oh, nay, but to dig for it at night and dark, it... The unaccustomed work, I cannot see. Oh, I did not know my master's courage. I would think he was afraid. Oh, what have I to fear? Not man, surely. And in your pocket lies a pardon from the king. Nay, and I do not fear the dead. Here is very dim. How plainly you can hear those rusty chains. It is like that other night. The night on which you swore by the gallows tree. And death. And justice. The deep rocks. Fairness and sufferings. Share and share alike on earth or down in hell. I meant it when I swore that oath. I meant it though I laughed and mocked. It was all your fault I did this thing. <laughs> Effie and I met you. We were his brothers. Jack was such a fool. A lout. My officer, he. He amused me and... And admired me. My fearful master. The sentimental type. He's still. Can other men have feelings? In the lowest beast can I not be one tiny bit of... God. I... I had not to do with God. Who are you who have sat my strength and made me weak? My name is Kate. And I told you long ago. And yeah, that's all you've told me. Whence came you, woman? From the cabin of an English brig, some wicked pirate took a crime. Ye insolent wench! 
turn not your back on me and walk away. Did I turn my back? Who I was with. You! How long have they changed, grown now, as the weight they bear swings in the wind? We are underneath his corpse. I did not realize we walked so fast. He seems to sense your presence. See his body begin to turn. I'm so fearful to leave it back. It's now, don't say such things. Jack, Jack, go on. Stop moving like that. I've done your bidding. He is your slave again. Your dog. Kate, those eyeless sockets plucked by crows. I see a light. To me, no light can dead men die. No, 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 I know, but. Kate, there's a movement of that drooping jaw. As though it prepared itself for speech. There can be no speech from dead men's lips. I know that too, but. Kate! Whence comes that singing? I I do, dear son. The favorite song of the comrades he betrayed. Nay, 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 that cannot be. Kate, the chains that hold this corpse are stretching. Jack, that feet are on the ground. He's coming for me with dead arms outstretched. Jack, Jack Gore, for God's sake, keep away. Ah! Don't touch me with your cold, dead hands. Kate, Kate, help. He binds his chains about my neck. Don't let him lift me to that gallows. Don't let him lift me to that gallows. Ah! Share and share alike. On earth or down in hell. Ah, Kate. But for this she brought me here. For death. I, I know who ye are now. Hear what I swore by. You are justice. You know, them old Greek people had a notion that ideals sometimes walk the earth in human form. So maybe that girl was justice. And now, Satan, if these folks would just sit still, we'll be back in a minute and tell them about the pretty yarn we're saving for a next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll, Satan, instead of telling folks what we're going to let them see next week, just a little bit of them for themselves. Gaze into the embers of our fire. Gaze into the embers deep and listen. Robert, I hear footsteps. There's something in this room. No, 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 no. They can't be, Susie. You will leave alone here. No, we're not alone. Look at those shadows. Good Lord. It's a man without a head. Ah! <laughs> That's part of our yarn about Rockabye Baby. <laughs> Rockabye Baby. Down for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. 
Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X... X, 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 Minus... Minus... minus, one. One... One... Tonight's story, The Man in the Moon. Attention, attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention, this is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons, Smigley, Jonathan... Five feet eight inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid scar behind right ear, Hello. last seen wearing Hello. blue top coat and Hello. tan cap, Hello, wanted by Los Angeles. Hello. Hello, get off this wavelength. Hello, this Earth. is a restricted band. Hello. Hello, Earth. Uh, whoever you are, you're on a Hello, coded wavelength. Earth. Tune out. This frequency is reserved Hello. for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This is the moon Whoa. calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy is loony. Jake and transmission. Jake, this is Charlie of the code room. Some crackpot is on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. I've got CQ trying to trace a source now. We should have a triangulation any second. Well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham is in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Yeah, they ought to take his license away. Oh, here comes Lenny with the directional fix. Right. Thanks, Lenny. Hey. Hey, what's this? This is impossible. What's going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycles. Oh, listen, Charlie, unless this is a gag, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Yes, there is, Charlie, straight up. Oh, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal is coming from the moon. Are you nuts? Well, somebody might be bouncing it, like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where'd you study basic radio? Now, listen, Flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. Mr. Timken. Mr. Timken. Well, what's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Listen, Mr. Timken. You know I'm a sober citizen, right? Mm hmm. For once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, right? Right. In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I well, once what's ever. What's the matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but. We are getting an SOS from the moon. <laughs> That's it. He started on voice and switched to Morse. The way the signal repeats sounds like a phonograph record or automatic sender of some sort. Well, what's it say? Uh, let's see here. Can you read me? Help Otterburn. Will contact when moon is in phase. Let's have that again. Can you read me? Help Otterburn. Will contact when moon is in phase. Otterburn. That sounds like a name, huh? Otterburn. Otterburn. Wait a minute. Something registered? Cornelius Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? Talk to the chief. Hey, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I am going to tell him, Charlie. Hey. Oh, this just too much for me. <laughs> Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on city desk. Well, mama. O'Brien. Seamus, yeah. Charlie Starbuck, down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? All right, shoot, noodle brain. I'll stay on your wavelength for 30 seconds. Okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. Yeah. What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus, if you don't know a story when you see one, I'll... I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. So long, Orson Welles. How do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Now, does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist, reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, just five years ago, vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. 
This is some crackpot trying to jam the airways. Yes, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So Mr. are a lot of names. But I have a theory that... I uh, was afraid uh, of that. Henry, you always have a theory. Let's see, what was it last year? Oh, yes. That people disappear in occupational sites. But it's true. Please, I... Henry, I'm a busy man. You expect me to believe that this Otterburn is sitting up on the moon, sending out shortwave messages? Well, he might be on Earth bouncing the messages off the moon. But who's to say he isn't on the moon? Henry, as chief of this bureau, I have my hands full trying to coordinate reports from 48 states in Alaska. I have no time to include the moon. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Uh, but, Mr. Wade... Out, I... I'm busy. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, here. Take this folder of reports for the dead file. Yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? Yes. I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing persons reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau. But no more nonsense, eh? No, sir. No more nonsense. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? You are Mr. Henry Timken. <laughs> That's my name. Uh, permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. Oh, how do you do? Oh, are you a newspaper man? Not exactly. I write as a hobby. Occasionally, the papers give me leads on an assignment. If I may have a moment of your time... Well, certainly. Just sit down at my desk over here. Thank you. <laughs> my, that's quite a stack of papers. <laughs> Filing. Uh, I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. I admire the precise mind, Mr... Uh... Timken. Of course. Now, Mr. Timken... Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon? Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It may be a bounce. They have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, and, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Really? I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my briefcase. Well, I, I don't bother. I... Oh, but I insist. Oh, yes. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Oh, thank you very much. Now... About this message from the moon, Mr. Timken. Well, now, we don't know for sure, as I said, but I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, do you know him? I once wrote an article on his contribution to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn. Years ahead of his contemporaries. Mm. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Well, if you will come here tomorrow night at 8, Mr. Philo, we may learn the answer to that question. I've arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. <coughs> Until tomorrow night, then. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Philo. Hmm. Uh, let's see now. Aiken, Abelard, Abramson, Rono, Atch. Well, that's funny. Now, where did this list of names come from? Paul Aaron's. Astromathematician, Robert Simons, electronic engineer, Carl Parker, mining specialist. Well, this must have gotten mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. Peculiar list of names. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Timken. See, we made the papers. Oh? And how? And as the chief steamed up about it, he really gave me what for. What did the paper say? Oh, mostly ha-ha. Here's the Herald. Listen. Man on the moon contacts missing persons bureau. Missing atomic scientists sitting on the moon, say bureau experts, etc., etc. What a panic. Well, no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Say, about tonight, Mr. Timken, I don't now, know... Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room. Yeah, but I didn't expect... Well, this. I'll take full responsibility uh -oh. with Mr. Let's, Wade. Uh, the time for the morning broadcast. We got quite a list today. Well, mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Why, well, ain't self-conscious. Just stick around. Yes. <clears throat> attention, attention. This is the Federal Missing Persons Bureau calling all local agencies. Nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, what? five feet five, brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin, thick glasses. Aaron's. Occupation, astromathematician. Missing, missing since 6 o'clock this morning, <laughs> being sought by Bel Air police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat, Dr. Paul uh, Charlie, Aaron. shut it off a second. Hold it. Uh, delay one minute. Listen, Mr. Timken, it's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt us. Uh, this is important. Did you say Dr. Aaron's was reported missing this morning? 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. That, are you certain, Charlie? Positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh... Let's see. Simons, Robert, what? engineer. What? 
came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? Hey, what's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. It's nothing, Charlie, except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk, and that list included the names of those two men who were reported missing within the last hour. What? Oh, that don't sound right to me. Well, it isn't right, Charlie. It leaves a big question to be answered. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? Well, I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas, Henry? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Well, uh, a science feature writer. I see. You were the leak on that story, then? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I was. I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing matter. Well, we'll deal with that later. Uh, yes, sir. What's this Philo like? Well, he's, he's a strange old duck, bald, thick glasses, tall. He walks stooped over. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but, of course, being a science writer, he... Is there any other possibility? Well, I believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That seems to be a very remote possibility. Well, <clears throat> The Missing Persons Bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. I do not require a statement of policy. Yes, sir. What's the theory? But for some time now, it has been my contention that in a country like ours, where even the cleverest criminal can be ferreted out and located eventually, there is no such thing as a missing person. <sighs> I was afraid of that. Now, uh, for 12 years now, I have kept the central files, where information from all over the country is channeled and recorded. I have made a private study. This is beginning to sound familiar, Henry. And I have discovered that each year literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases. And then scientists. And... What do you think happens, Henry? I don't know, Mr. Wade, but I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Milo? Well, I don't know. But I would like to find out. And you think Otterburn may be a part of this picture? Mr. Wade, I definitely do. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like well, that? It is more than I, an idea. The, the two top men on this list are missing, and... Maybe and, so, uh, but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Why, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, but... And if you think I'm going to make myself a laughingstock by accepting such a crack brain theory... Well, I... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes? Yes? I see. Uh, What name? Just a moment. Uh, Henry, let me see that list again. Uh, Here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I, uh... I guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. Parker? Third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry, for a good many years now, I've ridiculed these theories of yours. I don't know. Perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you've really stumbled onto something. What do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. I I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. Good idea. I believe I'll join you. I also invited Mr. Philo, the feature writer. Oh? I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in you, Mr. Philo. Wait, you don't think... That he's mixed up in this? Yes, sir. I don't know, Henry. But it suddenly strikes me that we don't know very much about him, really. He ought to contact the police. No, Henry. I I think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. We're dealing with the unknown. And in solving an equation for the X factor, it's often easier to limit the number of terms. Follow me? I don't know, Mr. Wade. I... There may be more danger in what you have discovered than you are aware of. Let's keep it quiet. You agree? Maybe you're right, Mr. Wade. I I hadn't thought of the danger involved. Well, Mr. Filer was late. Well, he said he'd be here. He strikes me as a man who keeps appointments. Look out the window. Yes, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. We can't wait much longer. Well, it's a perfectly clear night for transmission. If anybody's sending, we ought to pick it up with this equipment. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. 
I never realized how eerie this office could be when it was empty. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Fowler when he comes. Are you getting anything? Just some foreign stuff, I think. That's a peculiar transmission sound. Uh, uh, well, that sounds like something. See if I can work the selector. The moon is in phase. Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Hello? Hello? Hello. Uh, uh, hello, do you hear me? Oh, I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Uh, who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on, I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. Do you hear me? Uh, go ahead. Keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. Do you get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Could you start that recorder, Mr. Wade? Uh, go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Now listen closely. There is an Earth, Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon. Made up of renegade scientists and criminals. P Professor Ernst Halsman. He, he died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Halsman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escaped inmates of the asylum. They, they took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Uh, go, go ahead, we're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists, colonists from Earth. S slave labor, mostly. Uh, I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive for their flying disc. Uh, Still getting you. Go on. Last month, six others and I escaped. Uh, speak louder. You, you got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony. Planning to take over the Earth. Invasion. Oh. Hang on. No, 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 no oxygen. Hard to, to, to breathe. Listen, they they have agents on Earth. You hear me? Agents on Earth? Well, where? Who? Uh, hello? 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 Agents in... Henry, look out. Lights. Someone at the window, get down. Henry, are you all right? I, I, I think so. This shot smashed the transmitter. And the lights. Strike a match. Careful. It was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. We got a recording anyway. But, but not the most important part of the message. Poor Otterburn. Suffocating to death. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo was probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. But the police... You think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? But Henry, believe me, they'd, they'd clap us into straitjackets before we could finish. Well, we've got to do something. We need time. Time to get through. You don't think my theory was bunk then? I know it wasn't, Henry. Right now, my only concern is for your safety. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. Listen, there's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. Yeah? We can get down there. There are some delivery trucks parked there all night. We can probably get one started. The garage door's off the ramp, work from the inside. We'll start the mechanism and make a run for it. I, I don't know. I think if we call the police... By the time the, the police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. That's an order. Okay. But what about the recording of Otterburn's notes? We'll leave that here in, in the safe in my office. They'll never get into that. Let's go. You buzz the elevator while I hide the recording. <laughs> This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Let's try that delivery truck over there. I'll get in. All right, Henry. You start the mechanism to open the garage door, then jump onto the truck. Yes, sir. We'll make a dash for it. Uh, where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private. Miles from the nearest neighbor and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead. Start the door up. All right. Quick, jump in. Where do we go, Henry? Go 
Cross your fingers. We made it out all right. Anything doing? There's a blue coop behind us, Mr. Wade. It's easily following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue. Now Route 1, toward Baltimore. It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. Well, he's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes. Why'd you stop? I'll turn off the lights. <sighs> it worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I don't see anything. I think we've lost him. Good. I think everything's going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. Not much longer now. Is anyone behind us? I, I thought I saw the blue coop again, but I, I was mistaken. Whew. This place is really hot in the wilderness. We can stay here indefinitely to we'll figure out the next move. I just up this dead road now. There's the house up ahead. You're not going toward it. No, I have a better idea. There's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down the hollow where it can't be seen except in the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. We'll hide you out there. Now we leave the truck here. It'll never be seen. Come on. Yes. Uh, how did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. I bought it about 12 years ago. Come up here in the summertime to get away from it all. There's the silo. Uh, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Be careful of those bushes. Uh, uh, yes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's pitch dark. Oh, my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up and another door. Steel. Well, this is an unusual silo. Double walled, wood outside and steel inside. Completely fireproof. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. We're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Uh, well, don't be long, Mr. Wade. I... This, this place gives me the willies. Just a moment. Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It's locked. Oh, no. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade, let me out! I'm not alone in here! Mr. Wade! This, this must be a light switch. Thank God. Huh? Oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20. Mr. Wade, out! Help! It'll do you no good to shout, Henry. Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside. Speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. 15 or 20 of them. They're... they're, they're Sitting like statues, just, just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. What? They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. But, but, who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they're currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you, the one with the scar, is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astromathematician. Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list. Yes, you're familiar with the rest. They've all been, uh, shall we say, recruited to work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. Moon? Then you, you... You're one of them. Of course. Oh, yes. There's one whose name was not on our list. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. Uh, Philo? But I... I thought... That he 
was part of the conspiracy? No. On the contrary. His snooping made it necessary for us to include him. Please put the man in the window, the one who fired the shot. An agent of mine. A pilot of this ship. Ship? What ship? This silo was camouflaged for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companions will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you... You, you can't do this to me! We have done it. No! You see, there was another name omitted in that list. I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of no. Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage. I won't let you do this! You can't! Please! Please let me out! Let me out, please! It's out heaven! Let me out! Let me last night the following persons Timken Henry age 45 height 5 feet 8 165 pounds brown eyes slightly balding occupation records custodian repeat Timken Henry age 45 height 5 feet 8 165 pounds In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Man in the Moon, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Henry, Santos Ortega as the Chief, Ross Martin as Charlie, Sidney Smith as Otterburn, Bob Haig as Jake, Joe DeSantis as Philo, and Ed Latimer as O'Brien. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the sign on the window said Perigi's Wonderful Dolls. A woman and a child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about Parigi's doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom at... X... X, 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 Minus... Minus... minus, minus, One... 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 one. The Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay.
The Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the Eyes of Shiva. Come in. Oh, uh, good evening, Mr. Thurmont. Hello, Croft. Have a chair, Thurmont. What's on your mind? As though you didn't know. Well, I can guess, of course. When a young man about town calls on a gambler in his office... It he... means he's broke, Croft. I want you to okay another I.O.U. for me. Thurmont, you're in too deep. I can't give you any more credit. Listen, Croft, don't try any of those cold shoulder tactics on me. I've lost a fortune in this club. That's just the point. You already owe me 35 grand, Thurmont. When are you going to pay up? You'll get your money. But I've got to have a little time. That's, you, that's what you've been saying for a month. Now, let's get on the cases, Thurmont. Either you pay up or I use my own methods of collecting. I see. You're all set to give me the works, aren't you, Croft? If necessary. Give me one more week and I can raise the money. Sorry. I need more than your word for that, Thurmont. May I ask where you expect to get that kind of money? From my Aunt Lydia. Mrs. Wimbersham? Yes. What makes you think she'll advance you 35000 just for the asking? She'll have to. And if she doesn't? Then, well, I have another way of getting it. No, Thurmont. I can't accept vague promises any longer. I'll give you 24 hours to raise the dough. I can't do it in that time. You'll have to make a week, Croft, if you want to collect your money. What's your plan, then? I've got to know my chances. Well, you've heard of my aunt's rubies, the famous Eyes of Sheila. Who hasn't? I've got a customer for those rubies, Croft. You... You mean you plan to steal the rubies from your aunt? Well, if you want to put it as crudely as that, yes. They'll be mine someday anyway, so I might as well get them now when they can do me the most good. And if you're caught? I don't think Aunt Lydia would prosecute the family name and all that. This uh, brave customer you spoke of, who is he? It seems unbelievable to me that anyone would be foolish enough to buy such famous stones. Those rubies can never be put on the market. They'll be too hot. My customer will give me 200000 for them. And he has no desire to market them. 200000 Who has that kind of dough? A rich Indian importer. He's tried to buy the rubies from my aunt directly, but she won't sell. You see, those stones have a special significance to people of his country. At one time, those rubies were the eyes of an ancient statue of the goddess Shiva. This rich Indian owns that statue now, and he wants to have the eyes replaced. Well, I don't know. That statue stuff's all Greek to me. I never even heard about this Shiva goddess. You should have, Croft. Shiva is the goddess of thugs. She has seven arms and strangles all who do not please her. I'd say she speaks your language, Croft. Hmm. Sounds like a very interesting game. Well, Croft, in case my aunt refuses to give me the money... Are you willing to give me that week's grace to get the rubies? All right, Thurmont. I'll play ball. Good. Take a few days to work on your aunt for the money, though, before you risk stealing the rubies. Thirty-five grand in a hand is worth more than two hundred thousand in some goddess's eyes. It's a deal, Croft. We have a date, then, Thurmont. A week from tonight. Let's, uh, have a drink on it. Jim, it looks as though everyone in the Blue Book has turned out for this opening. Well, it certainly does, Fern. A nightclub opening, too. 
Uh, I guess the place is made. If they squeeze us in any tighter here, we won't dare eat any dinner. Oh, now we must avoid that catastrophe at any cost. Oh, Jim, help me pick out the celebrities. Well, uh, let's see. There's the mayor over there. Oh. And at the table next to him are Mrs. Lydia Wimbersham and her nephew, Hollis Thurman. Oh, I've heard of her. She's the richest woman in the state, isn't she? Yes, but young Hollis is doing everything he can to relieve her of that honor. Oh, Fern, she's wearing her rubies, the earrings. Jim, are those the famous eyes of Sheba rubies? That's right, Fern. Oh, good heavens, I never thought I'd see such jewels in a nightclub. Mrs. Wimbersham doesn't appear in public very often, but when she does, she makes folks sit up and take notice. Oh, gosh, this is exciting. Jim, let's dance. I want to get a closer look at those rubies. <laughs> All right, Fern, let's go. Well, Aunt Lydia, did you have a good time? I did, Hollis. You were here to invite me. It's quite a nice club. I suppose you noticed that your rubies got more attention than the floor show. Well, this is the first time I've worn them in a year. I was surprised. Why did you wear them tonight, Aunt Lydia? It's your uncle's birthday, Hollis. When he was living, I always wore the rubies on his birthday. And since his death, I've continued to do so. You knew that. Of course. I'd forgotten. Hollis, what's the matter? You seem preoccupied all evening. Oh, it's the same old thing, Auntie. You're not having money troubles again, Hollis. I'm afraid I am, Aunt Leah. How much are you overdrawn this time? It's worse than that. I might as well tell you the truth, Auntie. I'm in debt for 35000 Hollis, how did that happen? Why, I've always given you a generous allowance. Hollis, have you been gambling again? After you promised me. I know, I know. I, I'm wrong, and I admit it. But that doesn't satisfy my creditors. Hollis, I won't give you the money this time. What am I to do, then? I don't know. You gave me your word when I paid your debts last time that it wouldn't happen again. And now this. You'll have to settle your debts as best you can on your allowance. That sounds final, Aunt Lydia. It is, Hollis. Believe me, my boy, it's for your own good. It's high time you settled down and lived on your income. All right. Let's forget it, Auntie. Don't lecture me tonight. Do you want James to drive you home, Hollis? No. I was hoping you'd invite me in for a nightcap. Oh, of course. Come along. That's all for tonight, James. Good night. We'll have to serve ourselves, though. I gave the servants the night off. That's all right, Auntie. Give me your key. I'll open the door. Here. servants have left all the lights burning again. Uh, go into the library, Hollis. I'll join you in a minute. Where are you going, Auntie? I want to put these earrings in the safe in the living room. Go ahead. Mix yourself something to drink, Hollis. Right. Don't be long. I'll send these rubies back to the vault tomorrow. I feel uneasy having them here in the safe. Oh, it's a relief to get them off. They're so heavy. Let me see. The combination is... Three, one, oh, seven. There. Into your little box, back in the safe. Oh, Hollis, you startled me. I'm sorry. I, uh, I came in to ask if you think we might find the makings of a sandwich. That nightclub dinner was on the meager side. Oh, of course. I'll see what's in the icebox. You know, Hollis, I don't think I'll ever wear the eyes of Shiva in public again. Why not? Well, I had the strangest feeling tonight. Oh, it's silly, I know. But suddenly I thought of the rubies as real eyes. Huge, glaring red eyes staring back at all those people. Come now, Auntie. None of your morbid fancies tonight. <laughs> All right, Hollis. I'm sorry. Uh, bring the drinks into the kitchen and help me with the sandwiches. Right. I'll be with you in a moment. I hear footsteps in this room. Who's there? 
are you? What do you want? I want the combination to your safe, Mrs. Wimbisham. No. No. Get out of here. Now, if you'll just be calm and do as I say, you won't get hurt. No use to reach for the phone. The wires are cut. This is an outrage. Come downstairs and open up that safe or... Well, I'm prepared to kill you if I have to. It's up to you. All right. I'll come. After you, Mrs. Wimbersham. You're after the rubies, of course. But what good will they do you? No one will dare buy them. I'll worry about that. This way. Okay. Now suppose you open up the safe. Three. One. Oh. Seven. Very simple. Should have been able to figure that out for myself. All right, take out the rubies. What sort of a game is this? They're not here. You've already taken them. No stalling now. Fish them out. They're not here, I tell you. Look for yourself. Stand back. They're not here. And you knew they weren't. Talk fast, Mrs. Wimbersham. Where are those rubies? I don't know. I put them in the safe less than two hours ago. And now they're gone. You're lying. Where are they? Honestly, I don't know. I'm going to get those rubies, Mrs. Wimbersham, if I have to choke the truth out of you. Believe me, I'd tell you if I knew. Well, we'll see about that. Talk! Take your hands away. You're choking. Where are they? I don't know. See, if I... Answer. Quick, or I'll finish the job. I, I, I don't know what happened to them. I, I don't know. Where are they? My rubies. The eyes of Jesus. to the Avenger and the Eyes of Shiva. Honestly, Jim, I feel terribly sorry for Inspector White. I'm afraid he'll be out of office if he doesn't break the Wimbishan murder soon. Well, Fern, it's been almost a week now since it happened, and the newspapers are playing it up big. Frankly, it's a very puzzling one. Jim, haven't you been able to pick up anything on the telepathic indicator that might help? No, I haven't. If I'd been at the indicator the night the murder was committed, I probably could have. But by the time we found out about it, the strong emotional impulses that surround a death by violence had weakened, and I could pick up any confused impressions. Jim, do you think Mrs. Wimbersham's nephew could have done it? Well, evidently the police don't think so, Fern. They released Thurmont yesterday. Oh, that must be Inspector White now. Uh, let him in, will you, Fern? Yes, Jim. Hello, Inspector. Come in, Jim's waiting for you. Thanks, Fern. In the laboratory, Inspector. Well, good morning, Inspector. Well, nothing good about it, Brandon. Have a chair and let's hear what's on your mind, Inspector. Now, look here, Jim. I'm going to put my cards on the table. I'm up a blind alley on this Wibbersham case. I see by the papers that you've released Thurmont. Well, we had to. We had an airtight alibi, for the murder at least. That leaves you high and dry for a suspect, doesn't it, Inspector? Never higher and never drier, Fern. Well, Inspector, I don't know whether you want my advice or not. Usually you don't. Stop rubbing it in, Jim. You got any ideas? Spill them. I'm open to anything. Okay, Inspector. If you're really asking me, 
I'd say that Hollis Thurman had such a good motive for both the murder and the theft that he might be the connecting link between them, provided both crimes were not committed by the same person. Well, we've got a tail on him every minute of the day and night. And if he gets in touch with anybody, we'll know it. And where is he now? At the country club, playing golf. Playing golf? His aunt's death couldn't have affected him much. I've got an idea, Inspector. Call off your men and let Fern and me trail Thurman for the rest of the day. Okay. But call in a report to my office every hour, Jim. And don't give out any statements to the newspaper. Why, Inspector, you used to love... Now, listen today. here, Jim. Just because you got me up a tree, you can All can't... right, all right, Inspector. No feature stories until you solve the case. Come on, Fern. You and I are going to brush up on our golf. <laughs> Jim, I've hit another ball out of bounds. My dear Miss Collier, the idea is to keep your eye on the ball, remember? Yes, that's just the trouble. I'm trying to keep one eye on the ball and the other on Hollis Thurmond playing there ahead of us. Oh. Jim, I'm convinced that young Thurmond can't be guilty. And why not, Fern? He's playing to it a bit of game. His conscience must be clear. Now, he's good, all right. We've been following him for 16 holes, and he's made at least 10 of them in par. We're in good company. That man playing behind us is good, too. Yes, I've noticed that. Look, Jim, yeah. Thurmont is going off for the 17th hole. Let's watch for a minute. All right, if you think it'll improve your game. Mm. Huh, I can't believe it. He sliced that one badly. He hit it way out of bounds in the rock. He's setting up another one. Oh, he sliced that one, too. And it landed in exactly the same place as the other. That 17th hole must be a jink. Look, Jim, Thurmont is mad. He's going to stop playing. Would you folks mind if I played through you? Oh, no, not at all. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much. Not at all. Well, that fellow's just as good as Thurmond. Now he's ready for the 17th hole. Wonder how he'll make out. Oh, Thurmond's going toward the clubhouse, Fern. We better go. We don't want to give him a chance to slip away from here without us. All right, Jim. Jim, did you see that? Yes. That fellow who played through us sliced his ball just like Thurmond did. And it landed in the same place, too. But he's going after his. Well, now, that's a very strange coincidence. I want Jim, we'd better hurry if we want to catch up with Thurmond. Yeah, right, Fern. Come on. Did Thurmond come out of the clubhouse yet, Fern? Yes, a few moments ago, Jim. He went around to get his car. I just called the inspector. He says we're to stay with Thurmond. Oh, we'd better get in the car, then, and be ready to follow. Right. I think we're on a cold trail, though. Thurmond hasn't even spoken to anyone out here. Help! Help! Get the police! What's happened? <laughs> Mr. Thurmond, he's been strangled in his car. Call Inspector White at police headquarters, attendant. Yes, sir. Tell him to get out here right away. Yes, sir. Oh, Jim, I can't believe it. Why, only a few moments Fern, ago, I... I want you to get a caddy and go down to the rough and get those golf balls. The golf balls? Why, what in the world can they have to do with Never it? mind that now. Get those golf balls and bring them back here. All right, Jim. And in the meantime, I'll see if I can pick up the trail of Thurmont's murderer. <laughs> Well, Brandon, now that we're back at headquarters and can't be overheard, what have you got to say for yourself? Not a thing, Inspector. Evidently, Thurmont's murderer was waiting for him in his car. Thurmont was strangled in exactly the same way as his aunt. It happened very suddenly, Inspector. Why, we just gave Thurmont a few minutes to drive around the clubhouse in his car so that we could follow him. Don't worry about that, Fern. If the murderer hadn't caught up with him there, it would have happened somewhere else. But the newspapers are screaming for my scalp, nonetheless. We'll get the murderer, Inspector. All we have to do is find that man who followed Fern and me on the golf course. He's our man. What makes you so sure of that, Jim? Because Fern found only one golf ball when she went down to the rough. Thurmont hit two down. And our suspect hit one down there. Now, if our suspect really went down there to recover his own ball, he would either have picked up his own and left Thurmont's two, or picked up all three. Since he left one ball there... He must have picked up Thurmont's two. It was too far out of bounds for ordinary stray balls. Where does that get us? Yes, Jim. I don't see what difference it makes whose golf balls he picked up. If those two golf balls Thurmont sliced into the rough had the roots in them, it would make plenty of difference, wouldn't it? Jim, do you think... I those... certainly do, Inspector. Thurmont deliberately knocked those balls into the rough for somebody to pick up. And we know who recovered those balls. We do? Who? Jim means we know what the man looks like. Inspector... I want to see every picture you've got of known criminals in this state. Come on, Fern, we're going to work. Okay. Well, uh, this batch of pictures just came in this morning. Mostly parole jumpers believed headed this way. Well, now, that sounds like a good bet. No local criminal would have taken such risks of being recognized. Here, Fern, 
You look through that badge. Yeah. Oh, this is the craziest case I've ever worked on. None of it makes any sense. Oh, it's beginning to, Inspector. Well, not to me. Be patient for another day or two, Inspector, and you'll have the newspapers eating out of your hand. Jim, Jim, here he is. What? This is the man who played through us on the golf course. Why, sure enough. Clyde Devers, jewel thief, served sentences in... Looks like you've hit on something, Jim. Inspector, have your men track down this golf ball. What for, Jim? I believe Devers was fronting this job for someone. Let's shoot for the jackpot, Inspector. <laughs> This is Clutcher Croft's place, Vern. According to the inspector's list, Croft buys the type of golf ball Devers used. Oh, but what makes you think Croft is our likeliest prospect, Jim? Young Thurman owed him money. Well, it's worth the try. Now, that's Croft's office straight through the entrance hall. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what to say. And don't be frightened, because when Croft opens the door to let you in, the Avenger will be right behind you. I'm not afraid, Jim. Good girl. Go ahead, then. Come in. Mr. Croft? Yes? What do you want? Come in and close the door. Mr. Croft, I'm from the firm Byers and Trimbley. We're in charge of settling the Wimbersham estate, and I'm getting a list of Hollis Thurmont's creditors. What was the amount Mr. Thurmont owed you? Since when our gambling debt's paid off by an estate. You wouldn't happen to be a detective, would you? I know, I'm... Devers! Devers, come in here! What's up, Croft? This dame from the police, I think. Lock the doors, Divers. Now, uh, speak up, miss. Just who are you? I, I just came here on a hunch. I thought I might find the eyes of Sheba Ruby's here. Why, this is the dame that was on the golf course. The day I... The day you murdered Thurmont, isn't that right, Devers? Who's that? Where did that voice come from? From the Avenger, Croft. The Avenger? We're sunk, Clutcher. Not yet, Devers. Grab the girl. No. We can't see the Avenger, but we can see her. Cover her with your gun. Reach, you... You're playing the fool, Devers. Croft is double-crossing you. He's edging toward the inner office to make his getaway. No, you don't, Croft. You're not hanging this rap on me. Take it easy, Devers. Stay where you are, or I'll drill you. It's every man for himself now, Devers. Come back here, Croft. Oh! You... You shot... You've had that coming for a long time, Clutcher. My gun. Pick it up, young lady. I knocked it out of your hand, Devers. I have it, Avenger. Stand back against the wall, Devers. Shoot him if he makes a move. It was Croft, I tell you. He hired me. He, he engineered the whole thing. Croft He's the man you... dead, Devers. Save your story for the police. talk now. Now, at last, I was beginning to think he'd never break. All right, Devers. Why did you kill Lydia Wimbersham? Because I thought she was lying when she said she didn't know where the rubies were. Did it occur to you that Thurmont might have taken them? No, I didn't know anything about the Thurmont angle until after I failed to get the rubies. Then Croft told me Thurmont must have beaten us to it. But by that time, Thurmont was in jail for questioning concerning the murder of his aunt. Yeah. We just had to sit tight and wait until he was free to make contact with his customer. 
When did you first suspect that the rubies were in the golf ball? Not until Fairmont sliced them into the rough. I'm an expert on golf. I could see that he deliberately sliced those balls. Then, after you recovered the balls, you went back to the clubhouse and killed Thurmont? Croft told me to. He was afraid Thurmont would begin squawking to the police when he discovered Croft had framed him. What was your next move, Davis? Well, he tried to contact Thurmont's customer, the rich Indian importer, but discovered he'd sailed quietly for home as soon as he heard about Mrs. Wimbersham's murder. He was scared of getting involved, I guess. So the rubies weren't worth a penny to you and Croft because the one and only customer for them was on the high seas. Yeah. And by that time, we were wishing we'd never heard of the eyes of Shiva. Any more questions, Jim? No. That just about cleans up the case, Inspector. Okay. That's all, Davis. The charge is murder. Three of them. Take them away, boys. <laughs> Jim, I still don't understand. If that Indian importer had sailed for home, why did Thurmont go ahead with a plan for delivering the jewels to him? Thurmont didn't know the Indian had fled, Fern, and he was desperate for money. Oh, good grief. No wonder the inspector said this was the craziest case he ever worked on. Well, you can say that again, Fern. This one almost had the Avenger battle, too. Too. All characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought, a thought, a thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio